the Almost Perfect Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, the celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm Bob Perfect, and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we're going to be learning from Mitch Harper. Now, Mitch is straight up one of the most interesting people I know, and he's a very multifaceted dude. Uh, he's in a band called Laugh Below. He's a vocalist. Uh, he's got big pops on him. He screams very loudly as they are a metallic hardcore band. Um, he's also a journalist, or he's been a journalist. He used to work for independent media, and he studied journalism, and his dad was and is a legendary South African journalist, which we get into in the podcast. And lately, or for the last few years, he's programmed, curated, and managed uh, c cultural events like the Durban International Film Festival, like Poetry Africa, for the sense of creative arts, and has since moved on into a freelance capacity and has been working on other film festivals around the country. So, like I said, a very multifaceted dude and someone who's got a lot of interesting stories, both about the industries and his life. Um, he's had a very unique life. How he got into the music he got into and the media that he got into is quite interesting. Uh, we do get into that story, obviously. We get into quite a lot of stories, as this is the longest, almost perfect podcast to date. And I edited it down, which is pretty crazy. But Mitch is one of my best friends. We've been friends for so long now. And we've had many, many conversations. And it is just really easy for him and I to, you know, talk, to go back and forth. And Mitch in general can talk a lot. He's got a lot of stories. Uh, he is quite a gifted gabsman, or gifted with the gab, man. Um, so yeah, that's who we're chatting to today. I hope you enjoy the conversation, because I think there's a lot of value to be had, especially in the second half of the conversation. Uh, if you want some hot takes and some interesting stories, the first half is more just getting to you know, know Mitch, getting to know where he came from, um, our rapport, how we know each other, how... The Durban hardcore scene used to be, how, you know, Durban used to be, how we both got into rap music, how we both got into hardcore. So it's a really cool trip down memory lane with interspersed with, you know, some knowledge dropping from someone who's got a lot of knowledge to, to drop. Also, welcome back to the new year, uh, to the Almost Perfect Podcast. Thanks for listening, especially if this isn't your first time. If it is your first time, also thanks for listening. But if you're coming back after the hiatus, thank you so much. I'm um, looking forward to this year of Almost Perfect Podcasting. I've got a few lined up for you already. I was up in Josie uh, for the new year and I managed to get a few interesting conversations down on tape. So I'm going to be editing those and putting them out over the next month or so. And I'm also going to be looking for more people in Durban to chat to. I've got a long list of people. But if you've got anyone you want me to chat to, hit me up with the email. I think it's almostperfectpod at gmail.com. Or you can just comment anywhere on the social medias. We've got Facebook, I've got Twitter and Instagram. And I'll leave all those links, obviously, in the show notes. Also, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash almost perfect uh that's just a way that you know you can give back if you want to if you don't want it that's chilled this is always going to be free for you so here it comes this is the first episode of the almost perfect podcast for the year enjoy um which we'll get into is that i, I come from a film festival background and obviously film festivals are watching films right well yeah i mean that's so that's why we're chatting tonight is i want to know about south african film festivals because you've worked behind the scenes on quite a few in pretty high positions yeah but yeah so what were you so i was going to say that like in terms of being robbed like this w when it comes to a day-to-day -day thing in terms of like when people are like yo like piracy is bad i feel 100 percent that piracy is bad for up-and-coming filmmakers i don't feel piracy is bad for hollywood especially when we as south africans are being forced to pay 90 rand a ticket yo Dude, that's 100 percent my feelings on it it shouldn't make sense to me that like for you to watch films that are hard are more exclusive for you to watch and now that so we're talking about film festivals the ticket price at all film festivals is less than you going to go watch uh, fast and the furious yeah which inherently just by its own distribution channel and it's the budget that it comes with it makes three times as much more money maybe, maybe even a hundred percent more money and the thing is though like 
I don't give a fuck if an actor doesn't make, you know, that extra million because I downloaded his film. I'm sorry. Like, you're making 20 million off this film? But also, that's not how it works. They make their money up front. Yeah, yeah they make, but you know what I mean? Like, for sure. But piracy does play into the fact that the people get less I mean, on the phone. I mean, the stuff. reality is you've probably, you've probably shaved off someone's a little bit of hush money. Like someone in the big office's hush money. It's yeah. Like, now they're just going to have to get creative with it. They may actually have to dip into their own bank <laughs> with it. But that is the thing though. Like piracy is both a problem and a boon though for them because it still gets the word out there. It still gets people watching. It still gets people talking about it, which gets other people, you know, to like essentially if someone pirates your thing and they like it, then they become advocates for it anyway. Yeah. Cause like, uh, so going back to it, fuck, um, Fuck uh, Lars Ulrich, just because. Oh number God, one. fuck yes. Yeah, so been fuck... waiting years to say that one, eh? And also, everyone's gonna be like, "Oh my God, a dude in a heavy band is saying fuck Metallica." Actually, very much fuck Metallica, yo. Yeah, early albums are dope though. Yeah, for sure. Like, don't get me wrong, Kill 'Em All, Whiplash, great song. Kill 'Em All, great album. Like, Ride the Lightning, not so great. Like, Masters of Puppets, overrated. Eh, I like the SNM version. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, if you're into shit music, like, cool, carry on. Well, I mean, but, I listen like, the to best thing that, But number one, okay, so fuck him because he created Metallica. Uh, number two, fuck him because the best thing that ever happened to him was Napster, yo. Like, because, he, number one, the publicity he got from fighting Napster mm -hmm. made made them more relevant when they were no more relevant. It was just before St. Anger, yeah. Yeah. It was like they had just done reload. Give me four, give me five, give me double wide as I. Ha. Baby. Like, shite, dude. Yeah. They were, they were swimming amongst the turds, yo. A lot of metal was at that point, but they were definitely Your swimming metal, amongst the turds. Your metal at that time was so shit, but Metallic Hardcore was pretty dope. Metallic Hardcore was incredible, yo. Metallic Hardcore's always been dope. In fact, <laughs> Hardcore will always be dope. It's just, it's well, like. There's a lot of bad hardcore, though. Yeah, this is what I was going to say. Hardcore itself will always be dope. It's just that there's more, that every year it, there's just more shit bands come out as well. So it's like, it, it's it now becomes whether you still have the constitution to wade through the shit. And also, the level of good is so high that, like, it's. Should I waste my time listening to this new band? Like, yeah. Look, the one thing about piracy is that ma it made my life difficult since that it gave me too many options to choose mu from music. But dude, if it wasn't for piracy, I wouldn't have liked half the bands I liked. I wouldn't have gone to go watch half the bands that came and toured here. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Definitely. And also, like, not even just piracy in the terms of, like, you know, I downloaded it because me being a child of the internet. No, it's sharing it, dude. Sharing it, dude. That was, dude. like, my shit, yo. So, what was... So, yeah, how did you... Okay, let's actually, yeah, take it back to our, how we know each other and stuff because it also does relate to your one creative outlet because you're in a hardcore band. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we can talk about how did you get into hardcore? How did you get into the hardcore scene? Because you were coming to shows when you were, like, 13. Yeah, I was 13. Um, so how I got into hardcore is actually a, a fucking hilarious story. So it, it goes, it, we have to take it right back. Um, and what you should know is that my family are st all storytellers. So we're going to be talking some stories here. We're like on our own version. Do you want to mention like who they are? Or? Yeah, so like my grandparents, um, my, on my dad's side, immigrated here in 70. My granddad got here in 1970, I believe. And my grand got here in 75. So in the early... In the late 60s, maybe early 60s, the National Party um, decided that for the expansion of the white Afrikaner race, that they needed to build ships. The problem is that <laughs> no doubt, they hadn't built ships since they fucking came to colonize the land. So the art of shipbuilding had lost. However, Belfast, one of the biggest city, uh, cities for only shipbuilding, was in the midst of a fucking civil war. It's the <laughs> only way that you can call it. White people don't want to call it a civil war. They call it the Troubles. It was white on white violence, yo. People were blowing each other up in the street. So, yeah, so white people don't want to call it for what it is, but what it, that's what it was. So my my granddad came here. He had been to like Japan allegedly. He had definitely been in Nova Scotia. That's where he says he was before he came here. He had been to Hamburg, um, where my dad was allegedly conceived. Um, and then yeah, so he lands up here in nineteen seventy. Allegedly, like a true journalist. Yeah, I'm gonna say allegedly because nothing is completely like. I wasn't there, so I don't know. And there's yeah. no corroborating evidence. This is all hearsay. Yeah, I guess I'll also mention it later, but you also mm. are a journalist or were a journalist. So we'll get into that just now. Yeah, so um, essentially, so my grandparents came here. My grand ended up working at CNA and she ended up becoming a music rep for CNA and worked all the stores in the country, like all of them. When I say all of them, I mean, she, she has road warrior stories about my my grand like hitting cows and like kicking out the windshield of like a golf one oh god and like the eastern cape and then driving back to durban at like two in the morning 
like but that the reason why she the reason why she like kicked out the window is because she was like she didn't want them to realize that she had hit a cow so she was more like and because she had been at the casino or some shit like that so there was like hilarious stories it's a story about like my gran um and her friend so your gran also like to put a little bet down here <laughs> The the grants is the original is the original punter, yo. She's like I have some horror stories about about the casinos. Um, my my, and it comes down to why I hate cinemas because a lot of cinemas also show in, in casinos, and in malls. But like so anyway, back to the start. So she was a music rep and eventually became an importer for music. Um, and at one point, like my grand used to actually import metal, and she got. Um, I I know this because when my brother first started getting into Venom. Is like which is oh snap 80s black metal yeah she like, was like that's pretty like obscure she like. was like oh venom yeah i know their album she uh yeah i brought their first one the self-titled album here here here's the cease and desist letter from the from the national party from the government saying hey you winnie harper working for cna our head office like please don't please stop bringing the shit if you bring the shit in anymore we're going to actually um arrest you so but <laughs> how it started so my gran essentially um collected everything that she ever saw Brought, brought in so every anything she ever imported she kept got a two sample copies. Of. yeah she kept two copies she kept one for the store and one for herself and um so we had a massive vinyl collection and a very of obscure music yo and my 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 mother is colored um and she is a child of like she grew up in the 90s her 20s were in the 90s so she's like into r&b and stuff so i grew up into really like weird music i was like into country music when i was like young and then I got into rap music when I was like eight, like no lies. Um, and it all started because I was watching a fucking video and there was an Eminem song, I think maybe. And then Eminem I was like, when you were eight, damn, I forget how young you are. Like, yeah. So that that's wait, that's like, yeah, I'm, I'm born in 91. So that's probably like 97. It's about right. Yeah. It's about yeah, right. 90, that would be, yeah. Yeah. That would, probably, that would probably be the Slim Shady LP, maybe. Or maybe a couple of mixtapes. I thought it was more around 99, but maybe uh, I'm wrong. I might be wrong. Because I think Marshall Mathers LP is 2001, right? Or it's 99. I think it's 99 because 2001. I'm pretty certain it was 99. There was a whole yeah. lot of stuff around there with Dre and like yeah. Eminem. So anyway, and but what actually really got me into rap was that I saw a video for uh, like, so like I listened to like rap music like all over, all over like real traditional shit. I was like really listening to a lot of Eminem and stuff like that. Really where I could get my hands on it is like an eight year old. Cause you know, you're still like, I also didn't have a computer until I was like 11 or 12. Like, yeah, like, I mean, they weren't really big in the nineties. Like, yeah. So I wasn't like really into like, so where I could get rap music, I would get it. Um, I remember just watching SABC one man music videos there. I remember seeing public enemy on there. Like this music video where they're like running, like driving away from the cops and stuff. Yeah. Like, dog. To this day, I still remember that. That was like, like there was so many music videos on SABC so, one during the day so, like when I would bunk school. So there's two crucial videos that got me into rap music. DMX also was one that got me into like, well, he's, and, he's way later. I was really and exhibit fuck exhibit. Yes. Fuck. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. A super underrated rapper when we actually get into it but um it was actually shook ones um, oh, snap. i saw that video and it was the beat that got me into it but the video that really got me into rappers rapping rappers rapping was a little bit later in my life was one mic by nas and hearing him go from that all i need is one mic to like getting really loud and like really political at the end that's shit turned me on and that's when i became like a full-blown east coast rapper because like when you're a as any Durban night will know. You start in the West. You gotta be a West Coast cat. You gotta be a Tupac cat. Which is ironic. Like, it's so it's ironic. It's so fucking ironic. We're dude. on the East, but like everyone grew up in Tupac. But Ambilo was also pretty Wu Tang heavy, hey? Well, I like, think. I think. We, we were very much Wu Tang kids. Yeah, like, I think Durban is also. It's all Wu Tang heavy. Like, I, I can actually say that because, like, even though, like, if you come from the South Durban Basin, um, if you come from, if you ask me, the Bluff, um, Shellcross, Chatsworth, uh, Amanda Mtodi, Adam's Mission, all that shit. Maybe not so much Adam's Mission because they would have had quite so, but like where there's rap, there's Tupac. Yeah. And the words, yeah. everyone knows the phrase, only God can judge me. Yeah, because like, everyone's got it tattooed on their fucking chest yeah. or above their stomach, like, or around their neck. 
the number of times I've th- seen that thing tattooed, like in my like streets, is hilarious. Exactly. Like people I know, friends I have have that tattoo. But I mean, also you weren't you weren't a, you weren't from the South Durban Basin if you couldn't draw on Superman S and a Wu Tang W. Yeah, of course, Wu Tang Ws were standard. Yeah, stock standard, yo. Like an S took a little practice, but the 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 W became a thing. And if you couldn't do it, you were like, yo the fuck you from son i'm joking but like for real it was so that's how so i got into rap and i was into rap for a couple of years and then when i was like 12 or so um my dad got divorced and he lived in a house with the with a bunch of people who were in their 20s to early 30s 20s they were like mid to mid 20s and one was a really important lady called monica lagan passat uh she was like she she would have a like a big role in my life way later on in life um just because she would like talk to me about what it was to be like a dude and like how to be respectful to women and how to treat women and like not be a dick and like i remember thinking like when i were when i would transgress i would always have <laughs> flashbacks to her cooking me crab curry while i was sitting on the stove I mean, sitting on the, 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 that the would counter. That be pretty hard. Yeah, well, sitting on the counter, playing with shit on the stove and her making crab curry on the stove and her telling me, like, what not to do because she, like, just had a fight with some dude. Um, but she got she was really into the Deftones or she, one of her friends was into Deftones. These are some really interesting, like, yeah, bands for you to be hearing from, like, older women who, like, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't expect that, you know, like older Indian lady as well. Dog. Yeah, that's and t- yeah, yeah, and we're talking two thousands as well. Like the shit, she would have been pretty out there for like listening to the shit. Do you think she came to burn? Definitely, definitely. I went to burn with her once before. Oh, it's not. Yeah, dope. dude. We like yeah, and that's like. Did when she I- change her dress for burn? Uh, no, she didn't. She like she didn't like, dress black no dog i think she was she was always kind of a sneakers girl because there was so many people that would do that like yeah i did see that but we were also we would also get dressed up for joe cool's dog so that's talking about it. A, so we're getting we're getting we're getting we'll there. Get there we're getting there because this is it's a crucial moment about how bob and i's friendship, friendship yeah really solidified but that's coming probably in like 20 minutes time so talk about how this is going so anyway sorry so i was really into rap music i get into the deftones my brother starts getting into like hard rock he's getting into like cheval and shit um drowning pool i'm not really into that shit no thank you no thank you i then start hearing limp biscuit and i'm like oh snap son yeah because this is because this is where also where limp biscuit is, is great limp biscuit got bridge. everyone into hardcore exactly so i hear limp biscuit so i'm like fuck me i just want to break shit yo yeah i literally I literally just want to break shit. I just want to say fuck 26 times in a sense, in a, in a fucking yeah. paragraph, in a conversation with somebody. and in, Or in a song. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I just want to wear my cap backwards. I want to grab my fucking crotch. And I'm just like, I'm just what, it, what any angsty snot knows little fucking boy wants to do. So then I'm like 12. I hear this shit. I'm like, sweet Lord. This is incredible. Dude, but then Especially something. Especially because of End Together now with Method Man. Like, come on. <laughs> incredible shit so i around the same time i go to the uk i'm still like into like rap music i meet it i meet a cousin of mine well he's like he's actually my dad's cousin but he's like a little closer to age than it. i was 12 he was 18 and he was into grime and this is the early 2000s so he gets me into grime as well i have to thank sl magazine for putting me onto dizzy rascal because yes because they actually from there i've had a lifelong love of grime and it's something i've kept up with mm. relatively well like from the side like i love it so i get to the, i get to the uk and i start talking i start t- talking to this dude about some shit that he's never heard of like he i'm really into the like the jay diller type Ooh, rap nice, music yeah. like the roots like that beat heavy i've like just discovered the jazzy kind of like i've just discovered quasimodo like sort of like sort of situation i then meet the this dude and he's like yo you ever heard of goldie and i'm like and i'm like no he shows me goldie i'm like dude that's the guy from the james bond film and he's like fuck yes you ever heard of wiley and i'm like show me more my my whole life gets changed i like start getting into like that whole sort of shit i get into the soul solid crew um i get into chemical brothers i come back from the uk I play with this shit for six Chemical months. Chemical Brothers are dope as fuck. Like, I play for this shit for six months. I then discover Slayer. How do you get from that to Slayer? My brother comes back home with one day with like a, with a pirated disc someone gave him of like some heavy shit. And it, I think it was videos. And I think it was, it was like... No, this is how I actually... 
we had gone to fucking look and listen in, ga- in Gateway. Mm-hmm. When that was still an odyssey from the South Durban. Like, that ship would take you all day. I bought, like, my f- so the first, like, CDs I ever bought myself, I bought from there. Like, went to that warehouse, the, like, CD warehouse, I think. Yeah. It wasn't look and listen yet. It was CD, CD warehouse. warehouse. I remember it, dog. And I bought, like, the triple disc of Rage Against the Machine's first three albums. So here's the thing. my Because my grand still worked for CNA. Like, a lot of those companies were owned by CNA. I used to get still get discount at that shit. So we would still oh, go up nice. into the place and go buy up music all the time. So music has been such a huge part. So like I went into like look and listen and like I was like buying some shit. And I th- remember, I think I bought, I was trying to get one of the Deftones albums. I think I was trying to get, because I bought, I bought White Pony and Bloemfontein at a Christian school convention. And then I was like, okay, cool. I'm oh, wait, did you do ACE school? I do, oh yeah, I, I'm a product oh, of ACE school. Shit. Oh shit. Oh shit, I forgot that. We are both ACE kids. Yeah, I'm, Fuck. A, pro- I'm a product of- Convention. I'm a product of, so how, so <laughs> just a so, small digression, but how weird is it that when you watch True Detective and they talk about, they talk about the schools and you realize that that's an ACE school. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Fuck. Oh, anyway. Anyway, so, um. Previously, I, I so I go by there and Diablos and Musica was, I think, forty bucks, and I was like, sweet. I'm buying, cover art. I'm buying that shot ACD because that's my DNA. I've yeah. known that. <laughs> I've known that shit since Thanks the womb. Thanks to your mom. Thanks to my mom's literally playing that shit every day when I lived for the one year that I lived with them when I was growing up and, uh, um. So I, I got a shot ACD for cheap. I got like a, I didn't get a Deftones album, but I got that Slayer CD. And I came on and I turned that shit on and I was like, oh my God. And I ran to my brother's room and I was like, Thomas, Thomas, put your shit down. Come hear this shit. And we literally front marched his, like our bedroom. And my granite was like, what the fuck are you doing? Get the fuck out of my house. Yeah, I can definitely dig- see your brother digging Slayer. Yeah, so, and that was that. So then we were like, we were on the deadly pursuit. My brother was also instilled in me like a great passion of that. When you find something, you go fucking hard into the paint with it. I used to be like that, like with musicians, dude. Like once I found one thing, I like if I liked it, I had to get all of it. My brother has like a, almost like a socio, you would say like a socio, almost psychotic, but I would say sociopathic like determination when he picks up something that he really likes. So it was like with BMXing, he went so fucking in. Like he would drop big bucks. He would like hustle like mm. money when he was a kid to like save up to buy like an expensive ass frame. And he's also been like a bodybuilder for all ever now. Mm. Like he's been doing that for about ten years and then so between BMXing and bodybuilding there was music and he was into ba- he played bass and so we went to go watch a heavy we went to go watch a show at the Mandine Sports Club. Oh yeah, when they were like dope gigs there. So before the Mandine actually we had gone to watch Most Precious Blood. Oh, that was is, at the bat center. Which is the crucial point because I watch Most Precious Blood. We First told he, that joke that like upset like half the Durban hardcore scene. But not me because I'm going to an ACE school and I fucking hate Christ. Yeah, like I like found Christ and then I went to an ACE school and by the end of it, I very much was not uh, in that vibe anymore. A hundred percent. I think a lot of people, unless you're fully indoctrinated to the vibe, kind of like you kind of get disillusioned with it. Yeah. But maybe you might still keep him as your Lord and Savior, but like you definitely, you definitely get disillusioned with religion. Yeah. So nonetheless, I watched The Rising End and I'm like, yo, those, that band is dope. They're kids. They dude. were super dope. Most precious blood walk up on stage and they shred that shit dog but what was most important is that the singer rob fosco spoke to my brother and i while everyone else broke down the show for an hour and my dad was outside actually like getting hammered with his girlfriend they were on a <laughs> date and he, like she was like so bummed that she had to go with him to this really white boy show with him so, so like his is so can you imagine it like you're a 25 year old woman and you're with a slightly older man who's like you got to take his his is like his adolescent kids to go the angstiest white boy show but it was also cool that stuff was all ages that you could go yeah 100 percent um also my dad like knew people from the bat center so we got in for free like my dad so yeah your we'll dad's connected it. like we'll yeah, we'll, we'll see if we got that. time but yeah well we'll get into it when we get into like how i got into journalism and yeah. yeah so essentially i got into heavy music from there and um he spoke to me about shit like straight edge and veganism and because they are a straight edge veganism band but they're not wouldn't expect yeah but it's also because they're also fucking political so they also get that religion's bullshit like the actual term like i don't i have nothing against people actually like praising and doing what they need to do and like everyone needs a crutch everyone needs something to get through life yeah we we got our weed yo yeah that's true and 
We're, yeah. Um, everybody needs something, and like, what is it? Whether it is so, yeah. So anyway, and then I discovered Durban Hardcore from there, and then I just became a crucial member. I was that irritating kid who showed up at all the shows, rash. Grab the mic. Grab the mic. And then from there, that progressed to becoming friends. I made all my lifelong friends are actually homies that I met. One hundred percent, dude. Like same. Like yeah. that's the thing that like that's why like I'm still like attached to it in like a way. Like as much as I don't listen to anywhere near as much hardcore or like you know, it doesn't really exist here anymore. Like, yeah. And it kind of feels weird like going to hardcore shows these days because it's not the same. It's not what it was it, there isn't that same connection that everyone had like it, like that was really a time and place kind of thing it's one of those things that like seattle in the 90s like kind of shit dude like, but also it, can't, it couldn't have been any a better situation for a child who had already flirted with danger and had a familiar history with danger that that was the thing for me as well dude like the violent and angry aspect of it all but within like a safe confine like to like express your anger to let it out and yeah. like yeah because also what it also is is that all the kids who are into hardcore you are ki kids of the internet and the only people who have that are middle class kids unless you're like you're like us like you and i who are like uh, like i would say upper working class lower middle class yeah yeah and um for me i like yeah, I got a lot of my shit through, through like, rashing older people to give it to me. Yeah, dude, I was lucky. So, you know Pablo from the crime scene? Of course, yeah. Yeah, so Pablo from the crime scene was friends with my friend Frankie and Nolan. Yeah. And so he would come over with cases, like, literally suitcases full of CDs, and we yeah. would just rip them from him. And so that's how I got into hardcore. <laughs> it was just, like, basically from that. Like, that's how I got all my music. Was yeah, so, like, but also a crucial thing that my, my like, passion for hardcore probably wouldn't have thrived if, like, I was at school with, like, a couple of dudes who were, like, into heavy music but they weren't into really like properly heavy music but there was a girl actually who sat next to me and would become like my li one of my lifelong friends gail who was into like emo music which gail gail milne oh, uh, snap. so but she was like into emo and <laughs> yeah i remember sister that. was into like emo into as well screamo emo yeah. yeah so and so like it was another person who i could like con share my shit with besides yeah, my brother shit. so we were like right on the periphery there because yeah that was like one of my social circles back yeah and then I got to know you maybe three years after I started coming to shows. I would have been about 16. We started like first like hanging out and talking. And that's where I kind of like our humor bonded because we both gave no fucks. Yeah. We both were like not. Probably give a lot more fucks these days than we did back then. We were pretty ruthless. Yeah. I mean, also, the, I think our, our ways of giving fucks have, has definitely changed. I think it's now our opinions matter to like the right reasons. Like, yeah. It's now, it's we care about what people think about us now. We're, we're, we're pretty nihilistic back then. Exactly. And then, but then you and I got pretty drunk at like a GMT. I remember. I, I was thinking about this today and we got pretty smashed at a GMT once. And we were sitting on the couch and. I was like kind of staring off at like all our friends and I was like, yo man, I don't understand most of our friends. And you were like, why is it because you're colored? And I was like, and I turned to you and I was like, how the fuck? And he was like, yeah, I've always wondered what it was like being the only colored person like in amongst all white people. And I was like, fuck, this dude's actually asking me like a relevant question. <laughs> and then I was like, well, so what is your story? And then I remember you telling me the story about like where you, how you grew up and like, I'm sure people know your story now. Yeah, if they've listened to other casts and read stuff. And yeah, yeah, and also, or like seeing you squabble with people and someone gets petty and brings up where you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so then it was kind of similar to how we grew up. Um, we both come from like not exactly functional families and then we like, we ran with it. And then I think slowly but surely we would end up going to Joe's together. Yeah, although Joe's was where you broke your edge because you were straight edge for a while. Yeah, this is also an important thing is that I partied with people for, and I partied be so I was I, I went straight edge at the age of 14 so like there was like a solid it's year pretty so. easy to do it's pretty easy but also like considering what I had been doing like yeah you I, had been jolly like, you I'd, had like already been like I mean yeah I mean like the like kids and 13 is not exactly too far of a cry from a film I've I've seen before yeah what was weird about 13 was I never saw most of that stuff. I'd be at the parties, but I wasn't one of the people. Like I was, I was drinking, but I was never having the good times. Yeah, well, actually, I'm kind of, much I'm, kind of I'm kind of the same. I was until like a specific house party. I don't know if you remember Mikel's house party. I kind where of do. Thing, with that, the the one where Kendall came and like stole the post box. And, like, I kind of do. 
Yeah, that 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 with that party that was like kids. I can neither confirm nor deny that I was there. That party that was like kids. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna say. But like, yeah. So like, also because you grew up, I grew up on the bluff, so like that shit's normal. Yeah. And yeah, so like seeing all that shit for me it was like, and we like kind of got to talking, and so I like gone straight edge, and um, a good friend of our ours, I don't know. Dustin was like, so yeah, he was, yeah, yeah Dustin was a good friend of mine back then. Dustin was a good friend of everybody's for a while. He was like the one, like, he was the conduit for like me becoming like a really dope dude. <laughs> being a, instead of being a snotty punk, like, he was like, yo, you don't Super have to be. Super posy, yeah. But also, he was like, you don't have to be such a chode. Like, yeah. He, I oh, yeah, he'd call you out. Yeah, he was like, that was it. It was, that was like, and honesty is the best policy. And, you and I also had that policy with each other where we were always honest with each other. And I'll, I'll never forget that, like, after I broke my edge, you were like, finally, now you can actually be like, you can be, you can be a cool dude. And I was like, thanks, Bob. I always thought I was kind of cool. You were like, no, you were, but like, now you can be like yourself. Cause like, now you've, I've seen you and like, I've seen the wild shit. Cause it didn't take me very long to start racking up the wild boy. <laughs> Yo, dude. Yeah. No, you, you have some, you had some credit credits like very quickly and then yeah we did joe calls a lot which is weird for two hardcore kids yeah i remember the glory days when they were like 40 hardcore kids at a did, at joe Cools. that was a weird thing it was like the whole punk scene not the whole punk scene but like the punk hardcore scene so like the gogo bronco guys yeah the so like the non the, guys, the like, non-church going guys the city ball guys the the bodyboarders the surfers yeah, the bodyboarders were always there yes and then like the U and the uk zin and rope team <laughs> yes oh yes that was yeah that was our social crew at joe calls on a sunday man yeah like, and going to school the next day <laughs> sometimes real school and then sometimes university i think i was going to I, by that time i was going to university but like um yeah you see i was living the waitering life so i was very much drawing hard yeah i was also waitering as well all my money was going to that was going to shows buying merch doing that shit I was I hadn't developed so yeah, like, like a party favor habits yes. So you got into the music and then you went to shows and then how did you start a band, dude? Because that came much later. Because basically you went you saw the rise and death of hardcore. So at a very we, young we, we all did. But yeah, and then and you but started a band after hardcore died. Also at a very young age, I got the reality check of that music may not be a thing for me because I wanted to be a journalist. Yeah, and not out of like some passion to change the world because there was a little bit of like social justice with me i mean i was a yc i was a young communist league member at one point before officially starting at independent newspapers i had to break it off before that <laughs> but um uh i w always wanted to be a journalist dude and like journalism is 24 7 and so my dad is a journalist and i wanted to be in journalism because I got to grade 11 and it was like, they were like, you have to start doing the work experience thing. And I kind of left it to the last minute. I hadn't figured out what I wanted to do. But the one thing is that I had a gift of the gab. I could bullshit anything. And yep, that's true. I was, words came pretty easy to me. The older I've gotten, this has been less so because I've stayed less when practice. But like, um, so yeah, and I, I wanted to be, I just said, well, fuck it, I'll do writing. So my first day I went to the Sowetan newspaper, which was part of the, the Times Media Group. And on my first day, we get in a car accident. I write a story about a, a kid who gets stabbed at a house party. Um, <laughs> it gets published. Relatable. Yeah, it gets published. I go the next day. I then do a story about a, an ATM bombing. Happens. Gets published. I then do some bullshit. The, the third day was like a bullshit story, but I got in the thrill for like court and crime. And I got and you thrill. hadn't like practiced this. Like it wasn't like, no, this was kind of like off the cuff, yo. Like <laughs> it was like, and this is not like a, a game freestyle. We're repeating the sentences and going back to what I know. This was like, literally like, I just remembered like what I, I remembered like how a newspaper, how I'd read news stories yeah. to be written. And I did this, this was in grade 11. So then I, in grade 12, I do this through, out my high school career um yeah, i don't do holidays i just go like I, I work when i'm not waitering i do like um i do i do i go to newspapers i go work for the sunday times and i go work for the sweat and i do this up until i get to dut um 
after the UT, at the UT, I pretty real I realized pretty quickly that uh, the department wasn't going to give me what I needed, so I needed to hit the bricks, hit hit the ground running. <laughs> I made a cabal. I make made a cabal of people. I think you're not the only person to uh, feel that way about DUT, bro. Yeah. So uh, especially if you've been in the journalism department, and which is ironic because the journalism department has generated the best fucking journalists uh, out of that country, dude. Yeah, well, I, mean, in I the know. Country. Like I know of like Matt Savides who you worked under. Like S- a- Savides is like so people will talk. Some people might say like Savides hasn't done like huge baking s- stories like in Kandla, but he's done bro that dude he has done lots of like big he's, stories he's done, Didn't he he's do done lots of big stories and stuff yeah like. he's done big stories but also no one i've never seen a more professional worker dog i've never seen someone he's dedicated to the w- dude dedicated but also efficient there's no wasted motion it was like watching Chris uh, Benoit in the ring. And that dog. actually that actually makes so much sense. Like, I don't know him as a work person. Like, I only know him from the outside. I don't know his work. I've read him. Like, when I see his bylines, like, you know, I'll pick the paper up. But, like, yeah, that makes so much sense that he's that kind of person. So, yeah. So, also, like, I'd also been in newsrooms as, as a kid because, like, my dad, like, when my grandparents were like, yo, listen, parents, time to, like, do some familial responsibilities here. <laughs> Take your kids for the weekend. Um, my dad was always working and I would spend most of my time running around the fucking the independent newspapers. So you felt comfortable there? I was comfortable, but also I had like, I was given privilege in terms of that a lot of the juniors that like were there when my, who worked under my dad, when my dad was mid-level and was starting and then started to getting into like the editorial teams, which he flirted with before going back to writing seriously, were all at newspapers before. Um... I mean, so they were all, they were all my seniors when I got there. They were all like mid, mid to senior level. So a lot of them were willing to help me out, though a lot of them also were also willing to, to like make me do their work, <laughs> which was <laughs> fine for me. Um, because it's experience. Like- it's cut your teeth, bro. And there's nothing better. You like the one thing I am very glad about having the grandfather that I had. My grandfather was, was incredibly knowledgeable for a dude who left school in grade seven um but like he was super knowledgeable of the world he was super knowledgeable very smart dude but also a very ignorant motherfucker this kind of sounds like like he's not my grandfather but he kind of is he's my being like my grand's boyfriend for like the last 40 years so like like he was born in 1936 so he's got some he's got some weird shit but also he's like he's like he's also not got some weird shit like yeah my grand is the quintessential blue collared dude that got out like ma- le- legitimately from dire poverty to like actual like shit so he but he instilled like a very hard working ethic to me and so did karate like actually yeah because you did that when you were younger well yeah because he i fucking he made me do something with my energy and i had like he was also getting tired of me renting kung fu films <laughs> so you could live one instead he was like yeah and also he wanted my granny was also very much Sweet this, like, he was yeah like all that shit well also my granny was big into boxing and like he my one of my earliest childhood memories is like me sitting on the couch with him while he drank cape to rio and uh drinko pop just take a moment to think about what that drink actually means people <laughs> um and then we'd watch uh we'd watch classic westerns and we'd watch early mike tyson fights yo and then we would also watch early early olympic boxes this, this just sounds like etv <laughs> dog but like but like we all had the shit all on cassette because my grand worked at cna so like all the shit was at hand so we would re-watch shit all the time so that's obviously why you're such a media hound like yeah it's because of your grand like that's got to be like the fuck. quintessential like fuck actually now that you say it probably dude it's probably that's actually a realization thanks for fuck me. off as dude i never realized this to be honest with you i never fucking said this like i never verbalized it. i never thought about it that way like i definitely say she's the reason why i was into music and i definitely say she's the reason why i was into like cinema which this is all leading up to it so yeah. when i get to the newspaper i then quit hardcore i then start thinking to myself you right, quit hardcore like i like i stopped going to shows properly because like i'm like now like if you've ever did like journalism the one thing that they'll tell you is that yeah, don't expect to get paid and don't have a social life. Yeah, you kind of disappeared for a you while. You develop a drinking habit with people who sh- also have severe drinking habits. Yeah, and other journalists. Yes, exactly. And you live in a bubble and you talk that shit. So yeah, anyway, that, that did happen. Stop, I stop make. I stop doing music. I like. I get into cinema, um, like through working in a film, like in like watching films, working in a blockbuster with a really good art section. Ironically, on the bluff. Mm-hmm. fucking unreal so this was also then journalism like on like so all holidays up into like this i get into journalism i start writing art pieces to like because i st- like 
when the news stories dry up, you've got to get creative for a diary or at the beginning of the week, my man. There's nothing scarier in life than having it, than having the editorial team look at you and you say, I don't have anything for diary this week. And they just look at you with like, what the fuck? Because <laughs> you've now like set them back. You've literally spat in their tea all and the morning. So that's what it feels like to them. So I started doing some arts pieces. Um, I started talking, like interviewing like musicians, uh, directors, film people. All the while I pick up my, I pick up the really good thing that all journalists in Durban know, which is the blag and to get into events where you con your way into getting into an event saying that you're going to write about it, but you don't. Oh, dude, like, yeah. <laughs> and I've been doing this. I've been doing I'm this. I'm not saying shit. I have, I have, I have written about anyone listening to this. If you ever gave me press accreditation, I promise I wrote you about it. He's definitely events. wrote about it. It's where the question is that you've decided to publish it or he's decided to publish this well, another story. Or maybe I just, you know, sent a WhatsApp message to someone saying, yeah, not very good. Yeah. It's also, that's, that's a hundred percent. There's other extenuating circumstances, as they say, to when a police uses a firearm in the, in the line of duty, but also, also like, so I've been doing this for a couple of years. I've been watching my, my, my peers do this for a couple of years. Um, I'm at the game so I can talk my shit. Yo, I'm like one of those mobsters that has a TV You're series. You're kind of on the other side of it now. It so sounds. yeah, I've, I've actually had to bat a couple of people cause I know that they're serial fucking and I'm sorry guys it's not personal it's just that you're eating into the canopy budgets um, <laughs> so anyway so I do this I write I write arts piece, I write arts pieces um, I get burnt out after two years straight of no weekends no thing no holidays I worked at Christmas I w uh, you really did disappear for that time like yeah dude I got I got real thin people like yeah. were like yo what what's the story and people thought i did drugs and i wasn't actually doing drugs i was just working i was eating unhealthily i developed the, uh, the ability to eat a bunny while driving yep you've <laughs> seen it he's actually seen it he's seen me do it um so all this shit i do all this i get burnt out i go to pretoria to go do uh marketing for a company where i work in a music i work f the co the company is like a multinational that actually happens to own shares in marikana this is all this is like fucking three months after the fucking massacre as well has just happened and i was one of those dudes that watched it on the new in the newsroom and i cried when it happened like i shed a tear i like walked away had a cigarette and like, so then why did you go work for well i didn't know that they uh, that they owned marikana at the time i only figured that out way afterwards but like well like they owned a percentage in marikana but like they actually were like they paid my bursary to go work at university to go to university for second and third year but what actually it turned out is that they it was some sort of like almost semi slave labor type vibe. Oh, where well, it, you gotta go work the fine for print, years, yo, and all you have to pay it back. Yeah, hundred percent. So I went to go work for them for like four months. Uh, it wasn't a great working situation. Um, it was great for me because I ended up like I re I rented a house, I rented a flat in Pretoria. So I first lived in Centurion, which was an experience because my first weekend there, I discovered a swastika spray painted on a wall, and it said, "Yeah." Yeah, so that was like welcome to Gauteng. Um, I had known some people from Joburg from uh, hardcore shows, and they were my only like connection to sanity. Because it was a cool crossover between Durban and Joburg, like where Durban, where Joburg bands would come down and Durban bands would go up. And yeah, like, and I'd been up there for I kind of been <laughs> you up were there going for, tour with bands as well. Well, not really on tour with bands, but I'd been up for like fight fest and stuff like that. I'd, I'd gone through and like okay. yeah, and yeah, but also oh, been so with bands. Gone, I'd been up for, with bands as well. I'd done I done a bunch of shit. I'd gone to watch other bands that were like I wanted to see. So I I I'd known. I met some dudes who were like homies that, that would become best friends. Um, and they, so these guys, Party Pete, Party Pete, Richard Staub, fucking yo, so many, so many, Ross Hallam. Yeah, dude, those are like <laughs> the three, like the standouts. Like, actually, yeah, all the face in the Gallo dudes, actually. Yeah, Ricky, fucking. Yeah. Yeah. It's so wild, dude. They're like, just from Among Friends as well, and funny enough. That's actually how I know Scrone. Like, I know Scrone when Scrone was straight edge. Well, he actually, Scrone he wasn't was straight, edge. straight edge. Scrone played in a straight edge band, but it was, it was never straight edge. Okay, yeah, because that doesn't make sense. But dude. that's how I got to know Scrone. And okay. so, yeah, so like, um, and all of those dudes like looked after me. And so all of them knew that I was into like music and stuff like that. And I'd been around them and I'd been, a, I'd go watch bands jam to like hang out. I'd been in Pretoria for a bit. I come back. I freelance for about six months. At the time, I'm also like freelance editing the Sunday Tribune's Lifestyle magazine. Um, 
where I then get told that the, the Durban International Film Festival is looking for staff, like temp volunteers. I'm like, I've been freelancing, staying on my pops' couch. I just experienced independence for a couple of months. I've come back. It's dire situation. Like now my brother's back from sea. Now there's three of us living in a two bedroom flat. Yeah, a small place and- uh, All alpha males, like all fucking like dumb as shit. Like we all bad, <laughs> all bad tempered people. It was combustible elements <laughs> as fucking Jim Ross would say. <laughs> Um, was there any stumping of mud holes? Uh, plenty times. I once actually, my brother, my first experience with jujitsu actually is that I'd been watching wrestling and the undertaker used to put people in triangle chokes and my brother and I got into a fist fight while on the couch and I put him in a triangle choke and he, I don't know if he knocked me out, but like, no, actually he came to afterwards, like after he like kind of like, it was one of the few fights that I won against him. <laughs> and it was like, that was like my first experience of jujitsu, which I would get into many, many years later and would change my life. But anyway, so I'm in film. I mean, so I go work at the film festival, What it's the year 2013, What it's also the uh, famous year. Shit. So you, yeah, you started that year. I, I'm the first screening that fucked out, son. Um, so I'm a venue staff member, like, I'm like literally, I'm expecting like some big ass interview, like some hectic sort of thing. And they're like, do you like cinema? I'm like, yeah, I start rattling off these names of like French directors that they know. And the staff are like looking at me, like, I don't know, like they don't know what I'm talking about. So I'm like, ah, this is kind of weird. It's a film. It's like not much pay, but whatever. I'm going to be going to get to go watch the films for free. Yeah. Like this is like continuing tradition of what I've always done without having to blag my way in now i'm going to do some work it's so much way nicer when you've I got realize. accreditation but accreditation is definitely better than there's no working such thing on it there's definitely no such thing as a free lunch my dog and um boy oh boy did i ever work that was like the that so this is the year where digital cinema projection comes to south africa it hits steer candy pause one month before the film festival has started that means no one's figured out the problems for digital cinema projection um, the team that the film festival you normally ha would use for d the projection team who would then become I would bring them back when I would like to start working with them many years later and yeah. Oh, yeah, many years later at, at the film festival um, They Didn't work at this edition. So everything just kind of fucked out and because I was close to Peter Machen because Peter had actually been my writing lecturer at dut and peter had taken over like the year before or two years no this before? is like two that... months after <laughs> oh so this was the year he took over yeah it's the year he took over so and that was like a tricky year because like it was like a, a this was the good, good report year as well no was that the next year so of good report year yeah so that's that there was also the screening issues it was just a well, fucking yeah, it's it's absolute mess of if a it could have gone wrong it could have it went wrong it was like it was and a, you guys did your best to hold it together. Do you know what if you know what that that scene in Boondock Saints when the Duke uh, co confronts the fucking the, the Boondock Saints at, after they've assassinated the guy and they just go back and forth and there's just bullets everywhere. Uh, yeah, it's a firefight. Yeah, it that's was what a firefight. That's exactly what it was. Like by the end of that festival, I had PTSD, yo. Like because <laughs> I had seen some shit. Like there, were... dude. Not just you. Like chatting to people about the film festival. Like it definitely seems like. Yeah, PTSD is a side effect. Mm. It's kind of a thing because you deal with people at their best and their worst. You deal with people at like, they've handed over their, their lifelong creation that they've worked so hard into it. But then you also deal with eccentric egos of not only filmmakers, but other people involved. Yeah, from journalists to producers <laughs> to, to fucking people who are printing your banners to the, the NFEF to to the hotel staff who are showing up every day they aren't being briefed by like upper people the upper echelon about what's going on like everything that can go wrong went wrong that year but i also kind of like so it was a super trial by fire it was trial by fire but i also did that same shit that my granddad had always told me to do was bite down in the gum guard and you just swing for the fences yo and i did it and i went Full fucking Eddie Guerrero on that <laughs> shit, yo. I like pulled off every slight trick I could to make things work. Like, and they called were kind in of favors, impressed. just like, yeah. Called in favors at everything. And they were impressed, yo. And um, they offered me, they asked me, yo, do you want to come work at the Center for Creative Arts? I was like, what's the Center for Creative Arts? And they were like, do you know what Poetry Africa is? And I was like, of course I do. I've been blagging my way into Poetry Africa. Do you this know is what Jumba is? Yeah, <laughs> and this is how much of a blag I was. I didn't realize I was sending it to the same fucking email addresses, dude. Like in the beginning. Like I go asking for accreditation. Yeah, I was just like blagging and it just 
Ir- f- like, what's the word? Irre- f- Frevent, like, if prever- like, frivolously, Fre- frivolously. frivolously yeah. yeah, I was just Fervently like, and frivolously. yeah, I would no fucks with mm-hmm. no fucks, and yeah, so that's how I ended up working at the Center for Creative Arts, where I would, I was asked to come work there by Peter Machen, but more importantly by a woman called Tiny Mungwe, who would be. Mm-hmm. Is so instrumental in the Durban like film scene and someone who I definitely want to chat to here, like on this podcast. I can't mention any more of a person who is more deserving to be in terms of almost famous by like their own choice, but also like also just really a a bastion for like making this shit happen. But yeah. also like, like she is definitely a hustler, someone who can a get resources out of nowhere, but also work with so little resources. But also a stand-up human being, yo. Like yeah. Tiny was so I meet Tiny Mungwe. I also then allows me to meet another good friend of mine who, and actually a kind of an idol of mine, slowly mm-hmm. but surely. I'm in a weird way. No, I'm not going to. I Stephen Jones. Oh snap! Okay. Well, actually, Steve Jones. His real name's not Stephen Jones. He's actually Steve Jones, and. Uh, yeah, so Steve's also a just get shit done kind of guy. I get shit guy. People yeah. think like Steve doesn't like them and like Steve like probably loves them, but just because of his demeanor, like yeah, Steve's like me. He's got no time. The, the time is of the essence, yo. We've got we've had many discussion, many existential conversations about this on the roof of this of the CCA building when it's been quiet, and uh, we've talked about this. But anyway, but because Steve was in sibling rivalry, and We're I a super instrumental band to like any Durban punk, and I'm a punk. Of I'm I'm a punk at heart, yo. Uh, to the day I die, I'll never I'll it's, never shave that it's shit. It's always within you. It'll always be with me. As much as I like other shit, and I'm just like punk shit, just makes me go, ooh, why people? I'm just like, <laughs> yo, that shit is will always be within me. I mean, technically that's true. And so yeah, so I end up working there, and in the first year I was a project coordinator, but I worked directly side by side with Tiny, um, in terms of. Her showing me the ropes of curation and how to plan shit and how to program shit. I worked then with Steve in terms of technical and how to design shit and lay out shit and how to like work. But then I met, I worked with someone else. And he really does love that kind of stuff. Yeah. And also I'm then, I'm, I'm then getting the film. Like f- I've always had a relationship with Peter Machen because he liked me because I was into film. And the thing is, that's also pretty wild because Peter, like historically, like, you know, he's been a journalist. He wrote books. He's had like dope art exhibitions. I remember like first coming in contact with his work when he had an exhibition called Corduroy Man at the KZNSA. I was yeah. uh, you a waiter did, there. You remember he did that book on, on what Durban. to do in Durban and he yeah. put Crossing Points and Wesley Van Eden and all the all the punks. I think he may have even put Louis de Villiers in the book. If yeah, Louis, dude, well, I might be wrong. Louis might book, not be in that book, but he might be. Well, that book is where we have found Slim, yeah. um, for the guy who did the Durban the, is Yours yeah, logo. 100%, dude. <laughs> this is also where I would meet, I would then be... Uh, then also uh, I knew a lot of those people in that book through my dad because my dad gave me that book and was like, yo, who is this? So I would like ask him, do you know this? He was like, yeah, I know. I, like that dude was here like two weeks ago. So, I mean, that's, yeah. it's pretty wild to have like some, like to be working under someone like Peter Mation, like just, I mean, for all his, you know, positives and flaws, like it's definitely yeah. a unique experience. And dude, also like Peter's a, Peter's a great human being. He's a lovely human being. I mean, yeah. like we all have our that shits. dude's got a big heart he's got a great heart yo and he was like so actually how peter like took a liking to me is that he had a poetry class and he already i think it was the second year he had been at dut and he really had gotten disillusioned with the kids and he wanted us to do a poetry piece and i wrote it five minutes before i got in there and i did the times are changing by bob dylan and i read it so <laughs> smugly and he like halfway through he just stopped and he said that's funny but can you actually write poetry and I was like, oh, you just fucking tried to punk me. And I was like, okay, cool. So I wrote, a, I wrote a piece of poetry in five minutes. And it was like deeply existential and deeply heavy. And everyone in my, art, in my class was like, because they also not really known me. And they were like, yo, this dude is weird. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, and yeah, so that cemented me. Like, and so, yeah, so, and I was always the weird dude of the house. I was yeah but also sorry and then another person who i would end up working with who would change a lot about me is a dude called sakila gomede who was like he had been at the center for fucking years um and he was worked in the outreach program i say outreach with ex- with um quotation marks yeah. and those are really sort of like it's a very nice way of saying township areas and people who don't get fucking art festivals 
And they don't get it delivered to them. And that has been one of the dopest things about the Durban International Film Festival is that they do actually literally take films to the townships, like where they can. But it's more importantly, dude, I spent many t- hours on the road with him delivering uh, publications for like our other festivals where we would have really deep political conversations. And like I was pretty woke and I was like, I mean, as I said, I, like I hate talking about this, dude. I hate talking about like. I was kind hey, of. you're I've bringing always, it up. I fucking. I am. I've always been kind of left leaning progressive. I was a little too left leaning at some point. Yeah, like, we've, I was we've, like, we've kind of married each other that way. Exactly, but like now I'm kind of. I'm like I'm. I'm old and I'm jaded, but uh, yeah. And so I ended up working with these guys, and these guys changed a lot about like how I've discovered how I thought art was because art for me came from very two like things. It came from the like the rap world which was very like it was underground but also very pushed to me through big money through big budgets yeah like because this is in the air i like got into music like my very period of rap is the golden era like 99s 2000s like that is golden era to me okay. like 50 cent changed the world for you <laughs> see i yeah i just didn't dig 50 when i was younger i didn't so dig them at the I, time i was I just like, like, 50, like in the last three years but yeah anyway. i was just like yeah pose and then it you. comes like, lowbrow as shit and then from punk as punk as shit where it's diy but then, the punk reality, but at the same time, like it's DIY, but it's DIY with some resources. Yes. Like the, the thing is, as awesome as punk is in its DIY ethic, it does come, at least here in Durban, from a middle class background. So in South it, Africa, in yeah. general. Yeah. So it was relatively easier to be able to get speakers to get a venue to be able to go and also to just go into venues. you had churches yeah there were churches that people could use churches are if if you are any kid and you want to like make a thing happen there's two things that i one i learned from sakile which was like caesar color centers town halls the cheapest shit to rent yeah fuck i'm giving away my own plans (laughs) but you you can rent that shit out for a weekend and you can do whatever the fuck you want in it literally you just got to pay the people the cleaning staff extra to stay late yeah, and, s- and that's you don't actually have to do that and some, some churches will do it for free and they'll just yeah. open the snacks yeah and you don't have to do that for Caesar Color Centers you should do it out of the goodness of your heart because you're a good events coordinator <laughs> um, but hints to all the people who don't do it anyway <laughs> but nonetheless um, yeah so working at the CCA was the perfect middle ground because it was my introduction to um, merging the two worlds of like high end and and, low end art. and yeah and lowbrow art low brow. because p- poetry is still not well supported in this country it's supported like if you're a praise singer or some shit or if you're like lebo mashile who is like who took 10 or 15 years burning rubber for her to now become an automatic choice but can we uh, poetry is also just it's a tough one because well it's also it's a it's a circle run thing because yeah. it's like it's the kids who were going to poetry circles then start running their own poetry circles and the problem is events. yeah and the thing is poetry hasn't well i'm gonna sound maybe a little bit ignorant here but it hasn't necessarily evolved like enough like it's no, not it's in- probably the most progressive section of, of like south african art yeah what do you mean like in terms of form and function like in not form and function maybe not in form function well actually yeah like, i look i look at international slam poetry stuff like i watch stuff on youtube and that and like i'm so like impressed with the creativity and but like i guess south africa it is just political and like that is dope but like it also gets draining but dope, like, but also slam poetry is 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 an art form it's specific onto itself dope. yeah yeah no i know like, that it's yeah like, like but there south isn't... african poetry has also its own poetry where like so we have that where it's kind of it's kind of shit because when you're when you often are looking for new poets like we would do for thing you would always be like oh that's someone who's kind of doing like a level like a like, light a yeah. light label machine but exactly. then you also get you'll have someone who does something like that's super straight up a very like traditional Oh fuck! I'm trying to think what the, what the, what his name is now, but then I can't remember. But then also, then you can also get someone who's somewhere who's in the middle, um, and then you get someone who will do something do like performance to... poetry. You know what I mean? And then well, like, that's the thing. It's the so performance f- side of stuff that like I'm like like well, that's the thing. Like I don't read anywhere near as much poetry as I used to, and yeah. I should do more. But like, it's... but performance poetry is definitely where it, where South Africa is definitely where it's at the peak, yo. And like you can always tell this because like South African poets can if they apply themselves can always get funding to travel overseas and europeans will eat that shit up like europeans eat up african performance art oh just in general general, but like south africans there's a reason why we are the most accessible and there's geopolitical reasons for it as well because you know like english and like our connections to the european world and like us as that one hilarious tweet from that dude in nigeria once said we are the england of africa yeah well yeah we're the usa of africa essentially as well like that's 
um, there's that. But like, to be honest with you, like, there's a reason why because the content that we deal with and like South Africans are like we're we're an unruly bunch in that like and maybe in the day to day like we won't put up with we we won't put up we'll put up with like people transgressing on us, but like if you start fucking with our major civil rights, <laughs> uh uh-uh, uh son, uh uh-uh. uh, and well not even civil rights our delicate sensibilities. Well, I don't know, uh-uh. dude. Like fucking unruly, boss. Unruly. Like it took like this. Besides this Jacob Zuma era, dog. There's been like long periods of time where like there's been like your South Africans have not just not given a fuck, yo. It's not given a fuck in some shape or form. There's always been like some pocket of South Africans that's gone like enough is enough now. We're gonna burn some shit or we're gonna throw some shit. It's also what makes us the best country in the world to live in because we. It's always a little bit exciting. Yeah, and also we'll discuss. <laughs> so anyway, I do. I don't think so. I don't see one on this side. Uh, oh, there is one more. Amazing. We can probably pause just now, although this one's super long, but I don't care. We can just do a long Sorry, ass. guys. I think this was like, it was supposed to be more like Bob and friends or like Bob, Bob and bitch chat shit. Because I'm definitely like the le- the least qualified person to be on this podcast besides no, yourself. No, uh, <laughs> I've done things. I know. You've done way more things. That's why I said it's maybe the least qualified besides yourself. But, it's, but the thing is, you actually have done quite a lot. Like, that's the thing. So with Diff... Okay, well, the weird thing is with... You're talking about Diff to eventually get to the hardcore thing. So... Okay, so I'm in the CCA. Um, now, like, I start getting experiencing art. Um, film Festival... The Diff is also a bit of a hectic thing because it's ha- in the th- four years that i managed i had five different managers and one came back like twice like so that tells you something yeah and there was so much interference from outside and there were a lot of I, like we go one against it because yeah you are a well, i mean there's also it's not like, it's not for, you know, people don't mean, need my opinion there's like it's well documented like that whole piece with like the whole debacle around with sarah dawson well, and, yeah, like, sarah and it's disgusting was, it's in disgust in the in the media like there's, there is always that, and I think but the thing knows. is, the general public doesn't know any of the shit though. Like they really don't. Like they see something like a headline, something with film festival, but they most of them don't even go to the film festival. So like yeah. they don't care like a, like about and mu- the influence. And much like Janet Jackson, the Counting Crows, they don't know what they've got till it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. But and that's just generally how things go. But like so anyway, I start doing this, um, and. There's the system manager position. First, the print traffic, which is essentially there's no there's like three tiers of of a film festival. There's like upper management, which looks which is directors, board members. Then there's management, which is film festival managers, the different sectors. So like industry outreach, the yeah. people who kind of yeah. run things. Yeah, the, there's like and there's sub managers within that. I I took the position of print traffic manager, which is a sub thing, but there was no assistant manager, so I just absorbed all the work. Um, and then became and like worked with a series of people who all taught me shit in different areas of life and had a very crucial thing to what became my management style um which i have to say is that like the more i've traveled the country and worked with different film people and film festival people is that like not many people have got the constitution to work on a film festival or just festivals in general uh yeah like events in general uh-huh. Like, I've got the constitution to do it. I just don't want to do it. Like, I've worked mm. on, like, music festivals. I've done enough of them. Like, I've, like, booked. Yeah. I've, like, I mean, I've done lots of different things when it comes yeah. to music well, festivals. Yeah, well, you're still doing You're still technically doing it. You do well, comedy, dude. Well, that's my plan now is to transfer those things. Whatever scale comedy. you're doing it in, dude, when you're putting events together and, like, whether it's, like, like, the, like I used to r- I used to rag on, like, open mic people, like, Beside, before, like, realize, like dealing with poetry and re- realizing what a position for an open mic means to somebody. But, like, people who put together open mic shit, like, at least... It's so important, man. It's super important, even at that small scale. But then when you start dealing with events on, like, a slightly larger scale, like, where you start dealing with, with stakeholders, um, whether it be governmental or private money... That definitely starts changing things a lot. It plays a lot. And you start dealing with that pressure, then you start dealing with audiences, because now you start, you're developing audiences. Anyway, I do this for a couple of years. I get really jaded. The old Ulbr- Sorry. So like when I was a punk in my earlier lives before the newspapers, I had a I jammed with I made a I made a group of dudes on MIG thirty three. Oh snap. This is me looking for an alternative to mix it. To mix it. I'm like wanting to chat to the peoples of the world because my grandparents are like are mad and I'm running up a dial up bill because they wouldn't get some sort of thing that was I can't remember what the scale up was from dial up before that. I mean from after dial up. So 
Anyways. I think it was ADSL. No, I think it was 3G before ADSL, like the first mobile modem oh, or some shit. Yeah. No, like. But anyway, anyway, so like, yeah, so whatever. So I'm still running up mad dial up bills because I'm trying, I'm downloading off my wire. I was downloading like mad shit on my Nokia 3510i, dude. That porn cost my mom so much. That phone erotica that, was that, like, that was the greatest scam ever. Dude, like, my mom like paid so much money for pixelated porn. See, I would wait for my homies to download the porn, and then because also uh, I didn't have. Why a good do you think I became phone. a computer monitor? Like my first phone, like was a 3310. It took me 12 months to save to save up for it, and then I'm pretty sure that my brother's girlfriend at the time pickpocketed them while they were on the first date. Wow. Because she had she many years later had a history of pickpocketing like her boyfriends. Well, her she stole from her baby daddy. Like so, that's what makes me think that it it was a kind of a recurring thing. Because thieving cunts, the thieving cunts, yo. So. I'm like leading a creative outlet from doing years of, like so I'm probably like my second or third year into second year second year into working at the CCA I need a creative outlet I've never had a creative outlet because now I'm doing writing for them which for production before they get a full time um dude that's why like stand-up comedy like is so important for me like alongside the writing because like the writing is my work and it's not like really creative when it's like a thing you have to do every week and i was like, real disillusioned about that dude because like writing had always been my creative outlet yep. it was like it was work for me and then i stepped away from it and then like i'd done social media as like work and <laughs> we've all done social media as work for yeah people. i mean if you're still like if you're still if you're still not smart enough to fucking Google, Google, I mean, to YouTube Google Analytics, like that is your own fault. Really. <laughs> not to take food from people's mouths. But <laughs> anyway, so and like writing for me had never been, and I, I couldn't draw, I couldn't paint. I, like my only other creative outlet besides writing when I was a kid was beating the shit out of people. Was my grandparents would put me on a fucking, wake me up at five o'clock in the morning every day during the week to go to school, but I would wake up at four o'clock in the morning on a weekend to warm up, to stretch, to be at the dojo at 6 a.m. so we could drive to like Chatsworth or fucking Tongart or fucking Stanga or somewhere in the KZN to go. Back when the highways weren't like this nice. Dog, but like, so you can make way in. Back when there was sugar cane between like the city and like. Dude, so that, places. yeah. So like, and so I would go in and you would weigh in and I was a fat shit because I loved Milky Lane and no matter how hard i trained and i don't know if it was being a late bloomer or some shit but i didn't fucking lose weight and i so i had to fight due to a 16 but i was pretty good at it for a couple of years i got somewhere got into the fucking Nutel team almost got to sa almost went to japan it was like dope this is all real good i'm fucking i get disillusioned with this because this becomes a chore with me so yeah. i drop out of this when i'm 13 i discover a love for music i start learning trying to learn guitar i'm no good i'm dog <laughs> shit yep same story bro dog shit like when i say dog shit i'm like i can dabble like i can blue i can do a blue scale i for can you. i can play wide straps um seven nation army yeah i can do that i can and play I smoking can, on the water i can play smoke on the water i can i that's and this would be so ironic because there would be a crucial fucking joke in my band like everywhere we've gone like if anyone knows that below's you've heard us definitely sound checks of smoking on the water yep or to disturbed um <laughs> And anyway, so, yeah, so it's the Ulbrys who I played in the band with in a garage many years before called the Kansas City Shuffle. We have a YouTube video if you can find it. Like, I remember you. that. If I you remember can that. find the shit, God the bless Kansas you. Kansas City Shuffle, hey? Yeah, and it was terrible. What, what inspired that band name, bro? Yo, dog. Fucking what? cinema. Me and, so me and Ulbry were into films, dog. We were into films. Half the reason why we, like, we became friends. So we met at a Mad Caddy show, actually. Because oh, his, bro his younger brother, Matt Ulbry, who back Woods, incredible fucking, a genius, uh, a genius savant producer. Yeah, he's very good. Rain Man, <laughs> producer, is fucking, uh, who has like the greatest unreleased back catalog of music ever. I can believe that. Anyway, so he's into Scar, his older brother goes with him to the Scar show. His older brother's more into heavy music, but Matt's into Hey, heavy Mad Caddies are Mad Caddies though, dude. Dog, they were a dope Scar band. Scar was shit besides fucking... All, the, besides all my friends is metal are uh, metalheads and fucking mad caddies and yeah, mad caddies at that monkey ma, 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 monkey. monkey and then also drinking for a living yeah everything uh, and rx bandits everything else yeah rx bandits definitely does and sibling rivalry anything else can kind of eat dog shit to be honest with yeah you. i'm with you scar fucking sucks but there's some dope scar it's like it just gave white people an excuse to wear dreads and cargo pants yeah dude fucking cape town dog like no disrespect hog hoggity hogs fucking great band but 
missed me with that music dude. same like i just it was never for me it's the same way that like nirvana it was for me it was for me when i was 16. no dude it's the same way that like nirvana or blink is still yep. not for me yep. Dog. yep yep and it never was and it never will i be. can i can still listen to it and go yeah i get why this is good i get why people I was like listening, it i was listening it to still immortal just doesn't hit like for me i was listening to a model technique while people were listening to animal of the state dog <laughs> like that's how fucked up my fuck and and then also like also like I when think people, I was listening to Hate Breed. Yeah, I was also then like also like re- into like I think I was listening. I had like started getting into Marty AD, Marty Marty AD at that point, or some shit. So anyway, so yeah, so the Ill Breeds then hit me up and like, yo, what are you doing with yourself, dog? I haven't seen you around in a couple of years. Well, I'm like, no, I'm around, dog. I was like, sorry, I'm not such a good friend. Like I'm like I'm kind of working my ass off. He's like, you ever think about being in a band again, dog? And I'm like, no. <laughs> that that door got shut when i was 20 years old dude i'm 20 f- 25 i'm like yeah dog that door got shut i don't even know if i could even scream because like i was one of those stupid kids that downloaded the screen Zen- no i got the zen of screaming from raymond douglas i and wish like, i had got it dude like i still I, like, got it if you want it nah <laughs> i don't know if i'm gonna start a hardcore band now but like i would still kind of like to yeah i mean it would it, like i don't understand like there's no breath control out of it but it like it will it's kind of funny like but anyway so like he's like yo so the zen of screaming is this like legendary hardcore like and metalcore and like just if you're a heavy vocalist mm. um training kits essentially yeah it was like, like a dvd that this woman melissa cross released that everybody who was anything in like heavy music they, anybody on road on a record essentially yeah i remember to, like keith was on that keith buckley from every time i die they keith were like, Buckley, howard jones howard jones had the ooh, greatest voice in yeah the world. Uh, randy blythe uh the dude what's the dude from as lay dying who tried to kill his wife uh they do the ashley de beer keeps but... like trying to defend tim nobesis yeah tim i Nibesis. love i love the con- like the subtle shots people throw uh on this podcast there are no subtle shots <laughs> i'm fucking adam gilchrist in this bullshit dude if i wa- <laughs> if i want to hit a shot i'm hitting it out the park my dude oh adam gilchrist <laughs> Oh, I might see, I might warm up with a slight four, but that's just more of a warning shot, dude. I'm like more like if you if you really want to get into Although it. Although you're more like Herschel, six sixes, come now. This, this is true, and all while Baba last be. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, what a legend. I like him and George Best are my, like my favorite sporting icons because they both did it while they were either fucking high or drunk. I can appreciate that. Or massively hungover, which is might even be harder than the the early the first two things. Yeah, actually, I agree with that because but, so, we've all played Sunday League. And you try to play Sunday League, uh, like with the Hangover, <laughs> you, it's the it's the end times. So anyway, so like the the Ulbries are like, yo, come try out. I get there, it's with James, who was in We Were Archers. I knew James because I liked him as a person. I hated his band at the Dude, time. Dude, you and I had so many conversations about We Were Archers that were not nice. We're not nice, but what but was, we liked the people. But what was super ironic is that when they were when they when they were t- tailing off, this is when they wrote their best music. Yeah, that's true. And they started writing dope music as well. And it has nothing to do with like the fact that we were like at the same time. I think those dudes had finally just got into the groove, but they'd also become disillusioned with being the only hardcore band. Yeah. So anyway, so like, yeah. Uh, Ulbreeze, everyone else is playing the band besides me professionally. Well, not professionally, sort of like Weekend Warrior vibes, waves sort of vibes. Anyway, everyone's done it besides me. I haven't done. We go to first practice. I'm like, not nail. I have these lyrics that I've in my head that I've had forever, which is, if you know the song, is Cold Front. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. We first do it, and it's r- super thrashy at first. Like, like me pretending to be Tom Araya. Like, uh, Tom Araya so is the singer of Slayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this is going to, like, try but emulate his voice. Yeah. But, like, I didn't know. No, but, like, the voice ah, pattern, ah, that, the, what's that, what's that, what's that, that. It was like oh, super fast so like that. The, the super quick vibes, yeah, but you don't. You definitely don't do that now. I can't do that. I, I discovered within that practice is that I don't have the breath control to do that. Well, I didn't at the time, and they were more like Steve. And this is like so Steve was like, show me the lyrics. I show him the lyrics, and he's like, do the first down, and then let's see if you can do the other part. And I'm like, okay, sick. So I go, I do the down, and then I try to do the on my knee part, and I can't yeah. exactly do it. And I'm just like fuck this is fucking killing me like i'm this, i'm sucking so much so i just turned to james i'm like bro you d- i've seen you do vocals like the one like so yeah, f- ironically yeah dude ironically one of the few times i ever liked we were archers when they first started out was when he did vocals the one time and i was like this dude is fucking bad ass because he's surly and if you know james is that he's a miserable prick he's my in the nicest way ever he's and it comes prick. out in the music it comes out in like when he plays 
and so anyway and i discovered that he is the best vocalist in our band i hate to agree with you but maybe it's facts b it's facts it's like it would be the, like the dude has a monstrous voice the dude has a monstrous voice for the tiniest body for the exactly like, it's so unassuming like when you two are screaming together like you assume it's you like you know like that's the whole thing like because yeah. also like but if I mean, you were on your phone you would think it's it's me with big pipes yeah like you would think oh he's got some weird mic technique yeah but then you look up and it's mostly just him and me like sw- me just trying to like beat myself with the microphone basically the old uh thomas mcwilliam the old thomas mcwilliam slash jacob bannon slash everybody who's ever, ever come before yeah i just i just don't have the i don't have the charisma to be scott vogel <laughs> i can't say it's good to be alive I when i don't scott believe Vo- it i don't even think scott vogel has the charisma to be scott vogel dude I mean, Mick Jagger isn't exactly as sprightly as he was. I mean, he's still sprightly, but he wasn't exactly as sprightly as he was. He never had a fucking back surgery like Scott Vogel did. But anyway, let's not get into that. So anyway, <laughs> so that's how I got into hardcore. And oh, fuck. Our I, first actually, show... no, I have to quickly share the best um, fucking Scott Vogel fucking... Scott, there's that website called so, Vogelisms.com or Vogelisms.org. Which, you, which is... This is how, like, actually, one of the ways that Bob and I became friends because we were both like, do you know what Vogelism.org is? And we said it at the same time. Dude, and like, it's just all these things that Scott Vogel from Terra said and shit like, can I get more stage dives on the monitors? activate the pit yeah dude fucking. it's good to be alive there's no there's no there's no trying when your friends are involved wait no it, it's not violence if you kick your friends in the head <laughs> what's up dude no the best was uh i want to see some stage dives of this monitor of that guy's <laughs> face <laughs> like, yeah fuck, dude ladies to the front of the biggest dude in the front <laughs> which is kind of ironic but considering that there are there, well actually nowadays but like for a long period of time there were no ladies at the front of terror shows no but so anyway so like so anyway we we do this shit so at the first so he does he hits the vocals we do it it seems cool and we're like okay cool let's do it one more time we write we, we cloud out the song in maybe two tries after that and i'm like oh shit so i'm like okay this is dope but i've been mystified before because i've had band practices before i mean we did the kansas city shuffle for like two years with like never leaving the, and the you garage th- and you thought it sounded pretty good then yeah so i was like but- uh, but now you had some cynicism on you. You had some experience. Absolutely. All of you guys. And that's also the thing. I no like, longer drink black and white whiskey. Let me just put it out there. <laughs> and and the my music is, taste even, has improved. Yeah, even crazy. guys like James and Matt, like, I'd say their taste improved. Because I was like, I mean, as much as they listen to some of the same stuff as me, like, I always like had like this little snobby thing against them because they listened to like the shitty stuff I didn't like. Yeah. Like, I mean, they, I still rag on them because they like the chariot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it's the same way that, the, that James is like, yo, you like code orange that's pretty much new age chariot and i'm like you're not wrong but He's at least they wrong. play our shows yeah, at least he... they play their shows dog <laughs> yeah and then it just throw guitars on the yeah. air i mean yeah i'm very much of the the cm punk ethos no gimmick needed son hey man except that's a gimmick exactly <laughs> anyway but that which is very much life flow anyway let's carry on so anyway so we do this for like eight like four months no yeah october and we played our first show in the summer yeah which the do we should we go into that the first show yeah dude i think it's because it was kind of it was kind of it was kind of hilarious it's it's a story so our first show is it's diy uh, so all this time while steve has been playing in other bands he's kind of set up a cabal with richard from oh, I can't, I can't, i'm not supposed to mention it anyway what do so you he mean? creates a thing called nose fix Right, which was a website, then it becomes a cabal of bookers. Yeah, like everyone knew who was doing it. I mean, I think if you know, you know. Let's just put it that way. Let, okay. me, be, let me be I, pushing I, I thought about it, was, it. I thought it was open, but yeah. Yeah, I think it kind of is to the people that know. But if you know, you know. If it's not, because also I think there's also this, they, they're wanting to like maybe filter it out. But anyway, so like the, there's, there's the various people all over the country who still kind of like heavy shit. Yeah, and want to bring bands here. And are also not goofballs. Yeah, they, well, they are. But they and maybe not in the traditional sense, but like they're like they they can organize people. Let's just say that exactly. But they, they can manage their personal some, lives and their business lives. Some of them still smoke tons of weed. Yeah, I mean, some people drink water. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so yeah, so he's he so he puts on the show. We bring out this band called Ashes, which are super fucking dope. But we're, so to pad the show, we are we open the show. It's our boys Conqueror who are the uh, reason like, why we are a band. 
a large reason why our direction is kind of similar in the direction because yeah and they were like kind of the best hardcore band to ever come out of the country hands down dog hands down and they also came at the end of hardcore well they i think they kind of Put they the were, last gasp well oh, yeah they kind of gave ha- hardcore a second win because all the christian bands were kind of done or everyone was kind of like either getting married or like getting full full-time girlfriends everyone was kind of like getting ready with business and then there were these dudes from joburg who just didn't give a fuck and were road warriors everywhere they were happy to share couches with you they complained never yep well unless you're you know richard Staub <laughs> and you trying to get food with him <laughs> and you suggest you suggest anything besides wimpy or spur like yeah but like wow he has the worst fucking taste those are literally the only two that i'm like th- those are the only two that are like off my list dude i would never say and i would never like badmouth my homie but it's, if you know richard this is like this is fucking thing and i say this too i've never had to get food with him i smoked a lot of joints with him but never like we've had pizza together yeah but pizza it's hard to fuck up pizza yeah though. i mean think about it like how bad Domino's is and we were being bullshitted by Devonez for <laughs> like months so anyway so um, and also, like, I had, like, become real good friends with, like, um, Richard and Joburg. He had, like, really looked after me. Like, he'd been there. Like, there were times when I was, like, not in a good mental space and he was there. Like, there were times where I was spending, like, I was at his house. So, I rented a flat. I remember this, like, in my last, uh, in the four months that, uh, in the month of December, I rented a, ha- a room in a and b and I was there three months of the week. The rest of the time, I was on Richard Stobbs' couch. <laughs> And he's just like, like he is that kind of just guy that third, would open the couch up to Exactly. You. He is also so oblivious. He didn't know when I was third wheeling. I didn't know when I was third wheeling. Like, <laughs> I just wanted to hang out with somebody, dude. Uh, shit, was this? No, I'm not going to mention names, but anyway. No, this is all pre, like, and this is also like, um, like, yeah. So like, no, they were like all the dudes. Ru- Russ Allen would like hang out with me. We would buy, Russ bought me, Russ introduced me to the Great Eastern Food Restaurant in Melville oh yeah the, the best restaurant in the country bought me lunch there bless you that's also a boy <laughs> so anyway which it's funny how it all cul- culminates in this one song <laughs> i mean this one story we play the show after our set luke smith our mutual friend yeah our brother who used to be in go bronco, bronco who are kind of like the they're like the, the other best hardcore band to come out of Durban. yeah and they were the dudes who like were the also the the non-christian band for all of us who weren't christians they were the band that we could be into like that we could also relate and to. it was super important and like boys like a wild boy bro we jawed like wild i mean i'd say we because like as much as i didn't play music in the band like yeah mm. dog you were definitely with the band <laughs> we were definitely with the band and not in like the like the fucking the i'm with the band groupie story like you were more like the the, the brand of gogo bronco <laughs> yeah you were, you were kind of like that dude who like would have like who you were kind of like shine to p diddy you definitely held the gun you definitely threw <laughs> you definitely caused a lot of the commotion fuck. that they were involved in oh fuck yeah that's slightly true actually there's yeah. definitely a lot of although the only good thing is, is that they didn't, need much, is they didn't need much much encouragement no. i mean also p diddy didn't at the time i mean he was rolling the j-lo <laughs> doc imagine that bro things were so good for D- p diddy and then one night in the club he decides to pull a gun shouldn't and then he ruined it j-lo ends up with ben affleck shine his best friend shine is in jail is now ex- deported to belize he doesn't even talk to shine because he's scared that he might get fucking arrested again anyway but let's not get into that but that's also Crazy where they're not like changes. yeah but that's also where they're, they're not like they will al- they would always come and fetch you if something went wrong oh yeah definitely they were they were, they were also like that so i also related yeah, to all no, those th- boys those are my brothers yeah. also related to all those boys um i also rarely enough only realized how much they enough i grew up around the corner from luke smith um in the, on the bluff yeah. yeah so like more yeah, relatability and he, well because yeah he lived just up the road from gail yeah and he had just and he had been tattooing me for like a couple of years and he was like so at the show he's like yo dude this there's a dude with fucking lightning bolts and i'm like what do you mean lightning bolts Luke? yeah 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 those kind of lightning bolts. he's like those kind of lightning bolts fucking ss lightning bolts and i'm like the fuck son like let's find let's let's find this dude so anyway during the conquest so and there was like a metal band that was playing that like i'm assuming that's the only way that these dudes probably would have would have come through because like this is durban yo there are no fucking skin like this there's racist motherfuckers there's du- there's like r- racist I, th- I, d- I do think it is a, there's a subsection of metal in durban that like has racism racist, but there's like, definitely no sk- 
after I skin hits, yo, I ne like all the years that I've been going to like shows, the all the years that I've been running well, around you, nefarious you, bunch of people. I mean, Durban. you don't know what tattoos always have under their shirts. This always just had one on his hand. Yeah, well, yeah, and he had one on his neck. That was also the wild point. So anyway, there's this dude, and he gets asked to like leave the show during Conqueror set. Yeah, because no fucking Nazis are allowed at hardcore shows. A hundred percent, yo. None of that shit's ever allowed. That's on site. Yeah, Legit. like please leave. So anyway, um, there's a big cheer. There's a chant. I think there's a video of the chant as well. I think probably yeah. Yeah, I think Brandon Van Eden's got a video of like their their show. Anyway, so we play our first show. Anyway, it's our first show. It goes off without a hitch. I... I mean, sound was pretty trash, but yeah. Sound was trash. It was also a trash venue. It was a fucking bowls club, but that bowls yeah. club is dope, yo. Yeah, they were they were very nice. They're accommodating. Yeah. And also... It's just the, impossible to make sound good in that room. And it's also, it's also impossible to have a, a well-behaved show at that place, by apparently. But anyway. <laughs> um. So yeah, so we play our show. I think it was like the fucking 10 round drinks. Yeah, if it, this happened on multiple occasions. But like, let's not dog any... Play. This is kind of like the tunnel, like in New York like this is how it was weird how durban works it's kind of like <laughs> it's like how the tunnel it's like everyone bad mouth the tunnel but the tunnel was still a, a fucking uh, a monument no that's the one kind of, i know <laughs> i was gonna get to that so anyway so yes yeah, through so playing shows we play the show our first show it goes off pretty well i think i think it sucked actually most people think it, most people say it's really good most people are like yo mitchell we had no idea I'm like, I yeah, had no idea. I was idea. one of those people. I had no idea. T T B H. Because it's one thing when you grab a mic in the pit. Yeah. It's another thing when you're standing up there. Um, I also... Being most in a hardcore band is like different to being in any other kind of band in the fucking world. Like, yeah. there's nothing like that. You are like trying to orchestrate chaos. You are trying... And you're like giving your like guts. You're like spilling your heart out. Whilst also trying to like... Yeah, like you know connect with people but For like sure. but the thing is like you know some other people be like oh you know everyone's trying to spill their guts out but like no hardcore guys are literally screaming their lungs out like punching like you know it's like it's a very yeah visceral and violent like it is thing. man it really is and it's one of the things that always appealed to me because like the reason why i was with rap was because it like appealed to like the the visceral shit now this appeals to the visceral shit like it that took over in my life well it's guttural say, as well yeah. yeah i also like had taken like it's not to say I, I hadn't started listening to rap again by this time because i got over that wanky shit so anyway um well also i had no idea and like i'm also what people don't know is that i can talk to a class of maybe maybe 40 people i had like guest lectured at dut and stuff like that um so I'm, you know how to I'm, command an audience a little no bit. but i'm i'm petrified of public uh, are you I'm like, if you put me in a room with a hundred people, I missed the gift of the gab. It's page for the public speaker. Yeah, because you can't con a hundred people in a room. I like, I'm, <laughs> I ain't no Benny Hinn, yo. <laughs> you can only con like ninety of them. There's a diff there's a reason why t where what's his name? Uh, TB Joshua has his has his paycheck, <laughs> and I have my paycheck, yo. <laughs> oh fuck! I need you to write jokes for me. Trevor Noah got like, if Trevor Noah's got writers, I need you, bro. We talked about this, dog. I did once give you that ter that horrible fucking white 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 joke about sperm once before. Oh, I don't remember it. Thank God. But anyway, <laughs> this is also my other th problem is that I'm born with a with a natural memory. So it's anyway, horrific if you're his friend. Anyway, so all this culminated with me like. Um, so yeah, this hardcore show it's gone like relatively well, but then there's a Nazi at the show. You have asked him told to leave. He gets told to leave. There's one last band playing. I can't remember. Oh, it's Ashes. It was band. Ashes. It was I'm standing like out there. The band from Belgium. I'm standing, you know, basking in the ambiance. Shirt off because I've just hit 428 degrees Fahrenheit in my body. That's two, that's if you don't know the difference. That's two, uh, if I'm correct, 220 degree, 220 degrees Celsius. Oh, is it? According to my vaporizer, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, anyway and yeah and we i'm standing there i'm dying a small death steve jones taps me i'm in a steve jones steven audrey taps me on the shoulders and says yo there's someone trying to fight ross hallam yeah someone trying to fight ross hallam which is a just a bad idea number one but number two no one fucks with ross Hallam. number two i know what's like i'd watch this as england my my dad like mm. is well traveled like i know what's like i also know what racism like breeds and what type of violence it breeds and like what gang violence breeds because also i done some like stupid adolescent shit and i'd also yeah. i'd been the victim of some stupid adolescent shit like um stuff i got myself into my own situation into and 
I was really worried that like this dude maybe would like pull a gun or some shit on Ross or like try and stab Ross. So I came up because also I didn't know if he like maybe called people because I'm from yeah. that like I'm from that generation of O's that we went from from the tail end of one on one fighting to, to gang fights to gang fights like at the club like that was to, bro, I was one of those dudes that used to fight people at the pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a fucking thing, dude. That's we like oh yeah, used to go hang out at the pavilion and then yeah, like the skate park was was yes. you know, a lot of great tricks, but also a lot of like random acts of violence. Yeah, you know? for no reason. Anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was one of those dudes, and oh fuck, shit, I shouldn't. I guess the statute of limitations is probably done on that no impressive charges yeah but also I don't, i've also like fuck it anyway yeah so anyway um so yeah you go i go outside f- and also that's my boy dude, it's my yeah. boy also i'm not gonna let him get fucked up because also well, i'm also worried that like this likely one, that he's going to fuck well i'm more worried up, that if yeah. this dude's pulled this dude's called but people that's the weapon and the other options and also we're surrounded by suburban cats who i know a lot of these people oh really you're well. definitely not going to jump in or definitely not i've going seen a lot of these two get get punked out in their own way in like small ways passive aggressive ways where like they could just like if they just showed a little penis <laughs> sorry that's actually really wrong wait if you let's, let's re- really rephrase it if you if you just really like if you fucking stand up for yourself you don't let someone punk you dog yeah life gets a lot gets seismically a lot easier you don't have to stress about things a little certain things sometimes i mean it can, standing up for yourself can also lead to getting knocked the fuck out but i hey. mean but yeah but then you get, don't get scared of getting knocked the fuck out when you've been knocked the fuck out unless yeah. you were like you were so badly knocked the fuck out before that you were like that's never happening again hey, it still kind of sucks i was also introduced to it because like my granddad was also like yo if you like if you if someone hits you you hit them back yeah no he, we also had a big well, thing that's that's been the thing here no one touches your face yeah, although I did have a period in my life where I was very much like, I'm not going to like fight anyone. I'm not going to do anything. I'm like in that, that period of my life now. Yeah. I'm definitely, I think the last couple of years is now it's only like, it's a legitimately a life or death situation. But anyway, but- fuck it. <laughs> so anyway, so all this leads to me getting in a fist fight with the fucking Nazi myself, Luke, Luke Smith and fucking Ross Allen. And we do this. Egg- a lot of people see it because I went fucking sprinting. I also like fucking Xena cried at this dude as I front kicked him uh yeah scrap and shoes it, it becomes notoriety because and now people ca- but also the weird thing was some people got upset with you like some people were like oh how can you like fight like you know, a hell a bunch of people were like why it's did like, you bring violence to this shit i was like yo are you okay with bringing open racists to our fucking vibes like, yeah like my dad was involved in the struggle dude like my mom's was involved in the struggle like my i remember being very young and like my mom's telling me like there was a period in time where like my dad and her couldn't be openly on the street together like because that was against the law i mean that's the fucking mixed marriage law you know so like i've always seen what that shit is like like i don't know where like what suburban world that you live in that like you allow racism to just casually go through but yeah like, exactly like there's consequences for it and especially like if you're because that's the thing like the guy was causing trouble it wasn't like because he came back into the fu- he came back in and wouldn't leave and yeah then shit happened this yeah, he, and shoot. he got belligerent like, and like it's dumb of me like yeah it's dumb because that could have also escalated like i mean the yeah. dude did say he wanted to shoot me but then i would have also gone into the same book as dime bag daryl so like <laughs> less popularity though but anyway so that's how i got into hardcore oh this is all while i'm the assistant manager of the longest well second third longest running film festival on the african continent possibly the biggest casual yeah so we worked worked for independent newspapers as well kind of for a couple of years on and off um all while like kind of like trying to make sure that like as many people as i know who are in the arts like get on i respect people who put who that's the thing you have in. you have put on a lot of people in a lot of different ways like as whilst you've advanced your own career but like you have been instrumental in helping like a lot of people get in like you know where they need to get in that's look that's very nice of you to say um i am really appreciative but and if someone feels that that's that's really cool it's really dope but like for me to me it's always kind of like i watched P- pay it forward yeah 100 percent, dude dope that's, ass movie and not only did i cry when Haley joel osmond got shanked at high, at high school dude got shanked with a bowie knife at high school dude. by a dude in a juventus t-shirt <laughs> who was a ponytail when he's like seven dog anyway um the concept of that was like yo dude like i always thought about that like what happens if i broke down in the desert dude like and like i asked someone yo like help me like is there a per- is there a good enough reason like for them to help me like have i done that to someone else like have i helped them out 
So like, in a, I always feel like a career advice, especially being a young dude, it's really hard being in the workplace because older people now are like being siphoned out so quickly by technology and also younger people. Yeah, and also just the lack of jobs. There is a lack of jobs and projects of I don't know failing more and like there's just a lot less stability in the arts. Like in some ways, I don't know. Like, how do you feel? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think there's just, there's like, there's more opportunities now than there's ever been because now corporates are getting behind art, but it's never been harder to sell it because we have social capital, um, acting as a, as a basis of which someone should be judged. Like someone I know was working for a vodka brand, working on a campaign for vodka brand and they asked him to get them, um, artists and they were like, so dope. We're going to put all the best. And like this person I know is a taste maker, you know, like. Not yeah. taste maker, like a, like a, tr like when it comes to taste, most impeccable choice in taste suggests all these really great brands. I mean, like all these really great artists rather to this brand. Um, we're talking like, I can, I can drop some names like Seth, Pim Seth Pimsel. I'm sorry if I bu butcher your name. The dude's known as the African ginger on, on Instagram. Yeah. Abe, uh, fuck. They were, I think one was Karaba Poppy. I think they couldn't. And I couldn't, there was like, there was a bunch of really dope names and they were like, no. It's got to be someone with 15,000 followers. And I, that just made me think. And I was like, who in the fuck that is a credible artist that actually has time, who's actually burning the midnight oil, putting incredible art together, has 15,000 followers? I mean, there are some people that obviously have you a lot a because they get famous. Like You catch a break, dog. And that's what art really is to me. It's like, it's like there are people who get, who get big in art in two ways. There are the people that like mow the lawn and set the trail for you. Yeah. They really set fire to the forest. Those are the people who really, who kind of do want to watch the world burn because they're literally ready to fuck it up <laughs> in their own time for, so that the future can be put forward. That's kind of my vision of things. In hindsight, probably Bob. <laughs> at the time, at the time, no one knew what the method to your madness was. Well, yeah. Like I've I always, I think you and I have a good enough relationship. I could say that there was a point where you were a bit m16 with your with your with your with your use of of like words to to end relationships and friendships okay and, and just call people out in general yeah no you weren't subtle about it yeah say that. definitely i've definitely been pretty harsh like but i've also you took to you you sometimes take to honesty like how i took to drinking after straight edge <laughs> Fuck, that's one way to put it, man. And it's like, it is a problem in this world, like in media. Like, I keep getting told by people, like, I need to say less and I need to, like... But for me, the whole point is if people are going to get behind me, it's because I'm open and honest. But, yes, 100%. But there, I think also you... But I'm also going for the public. I'm not going for the media. Like, I'm not going for the people. Yeah, dude. But, like, but also, I think you also hadn't figured out the, the way to go about it, dude. Like, oh, yeah, dude. Like, and I'm still... I'm an I emotional think, being, dude. And I think this is also how we... I can say that you and I are really good friends because you and I had often had these conversations about the methodology, about how you went about it. Oh, it's, yeah. You were like... You and myself were very much like embodiments. I, I can say this uh, retrospectively. Um, a lot of people have always said that I'm like very like advanced for my age. I feel old for my age, hundred <laughs> percent. And also, people have always but said that, that shit doesn't mean shit when you're actually older. Dog, no one actually realized until much later on. There's been like a couple who were like whispered in my ear, and were like, "Yo, I, we see you, son. Like, curtail your shit." I was, re you and I were young, dumb, and full of cum. To quote Gary Busey. At point. <laughs> point Don't break. expose me. Don't expose me and we were really like we were really like we we didn't know the methods dog i remember like i would do the same thing in stories like i knew how i knew to be ob i knew to be objective i knew to be observational but sometimes i couldn't help myself and i would fuck i would fuck people over it's depending on like the story was a throwaway story i'd be like nah bro this story's gonna get cut down to 200 words and like i'm actually like I'm not doing this. This is not benefiting anybody. Like, what the fuck is this going on here? Well, uh, yeah. So that was the thing, like, with, like, the website, especially. To me, it was, like, this whole, like, to thine own self, but be true. You know, like, what did you really think? And also try and make it entertaining. Yeah. So that's how I tried to write. And, like, I always thought, like, and I've also, like, I take, I take criticism sometimes pretty badly, but also pretty well a lot of the time because... Like, I don't mind because the thing is, that's what we're doing here. We're just putting things out there. We're just yeah. like, we're performing and stuff and people can be critical of it. Yeah. And 
that's okay. You might not like my stuff. That's fine. Like you can tell me what you don't like as well. Or I mean, don't necessarily come up to me and tell me. But if you want to write a review of my stuff, please do. Yeah. And I won't read it because I don't give a fuck. See, but now see, this is where you and I are like different because you are. Well, also let, let me just quickly go back to it, two two things. I have two thoughts. You ha- take criticism really well from people whose opinions you respect that's always been a thing from you yeah now the more you go on you've come to realize that you got to take more more criticism than just people that you respect yeah i feel like henry rollins like listening to henry rollins i've come to realize that as well like he's come like despite or despite despite him well that's like, kind of a bucket list thing that you achieved we were talking about this before the podcast and i'm only saying this because i love henry rollins and i wonder if he ever remembers me <laughs> yeah he definitely doesn't remember me but he schooled me a little bit dude you lived the fantasy like yeah. you and you are in high esteem with nardwa i mean a, and howard stern yeah. i think hey I, I got to interview fucking henry rollins and b, b you got shut out by henry rollins yeah like, good times only way not was best that Nardwa got henry yeah, rollins on, to apology yeah, but also his was on film and everything wasn't it yeah it was but like the pen is like mightier than the, than the film bro yeah like like that shit could always stay in your in your Google and in your Google Docs, Doug, or like a hard copy file. You can always run out of fucking space on your hard drive and accidentally delete a video. And then yeah, oh, but fuck. it's always on YouTube. And don't say it doesn't happen. I've seen it happen in films, like <laughs> film festivals. Oh, I can definitely imagine. So anyway, so yeah, so going back to so going back to you, Doug, you've definitely always respected people's opinions, but like not I've everyone's always, opinions. I've always like, I, but like, so where you're quite brave is that, Doug, you put yourself out in spaces where like. I definitely always consider this is tying into like myself being in the work that I did, um, but also also how my own approach to being in a band was taken um, was that I always considered myself a background guy, an ideas man or a background guy, a definitely an ideas man. And there's a, there's a narcissistic part of me that really loves to see my to receive praise and like to see my my shit go up on flames because like i was an overachiever at the ace school stock like that's not hard it's not hard but also yeah if you learn to con the system it's not hard at all no it's so easy to cheat there so easy but also i was an overachiever even at brighton beach dog i like had to leave brighton beach because i like knew shit and would fall asleep in class because i wasn't paying attention and then i would miss the crucial shit i like my mom tells those stories about me in primary school like having those issues yeah like all my teachers i remember other stuff i remember all my all my all my report cards were like great grades like really nice child but too smart for his own good I wasn't a nice child, and I was also like that, like you know, like was bored in class, blah well, blah blah. I learned from having an. See, the problem is that you're an only child, so you don't know the lessons. Is that I learned how to not get caught from my brother and my friends always getting caught. <laughs> so I was the greatest, like I was the naughtiest little shit ever. Fuck, and other kids always used to like blame me. Like I always used to like. Well, I was also one of those when I did get when I did get blamed. I was like one of those kids that always got blamed by like. The older kids older kids slightly m- more middle class kids yes yeah that happens yes definitely that was yeah That's dude, been, that, was that, was a big, that was a big bonding thing for you and i actually, yeah dude know? that was a big part of like yeah being yeah. younger and like being poorer like yeah is having other people's parents judge you like, yeah dude definitely and that's what always made me realize that you got to be good around those parents and it's kind of funny because like in my later years i started becoming really shit around like my girl like my respective parents um, I had wanted to go like, parents rather. Sorry. Yeah, I've had a few. Like, I mean, yeah, I've had a few. Rants. I've had a cre- I've had some really great ones, but there's been ones who have I've known they've clearly not liked me. Yeah, and the, but it's like it's kind of weird. It's like the older you get, the less of a fuck I've ever given. Well, that's the cool thing about that is you learn how to just be civil. Yeah, which goes back to you, you kind of actually. You've always put the difference between you and me is that I've always been a, a background dude, and it was so strange for me to be in a band but also not so strange because like if you knew me as a child as a as a child because you I were was, front and center yeah i was like at shows i was there i was like i was the i was the kid that was floor punching yeah like i was known i was known in Joburg for like coming up from durban in cargo shorts this really like chubby kid that listened to hate breed that was friends with all the dudes from bloodline lcd and re- and reason to live not so much reason to live but trevor death to my to this day is a friend so but anyway so like i was front and center so, but i didn't ever think like i would ever be like if someone ever shouted shouted me out at like an event that i put on i actually got deeply embarrassed because in yeah. my own way i always like mentally said i was always like prepared like i'm a realist yeah i like 
people have said I'm pessimistic and I'm like I'm negative, but I'm a realist, Joe. And I always I always think the worst because I love that little Wayne line from uh John, which is I pray for the pray for the best but prepare for the worst. Yeah. Oh, yeah, prepare for the worst but pray for the best. And that's like me. I really hope for the best. And I really do think that I plan to that shit. But it's not beyond. I've seen I've seen stranger things happen. <laughs> I've seen so much shit go oh, down like in my life. If you're in the like A event organizing like vibe, you know shit goes wrong. And then also just if you live in a lower class like Dog, society, yeah, and you day, just know day shit to goes day, wrong. even yeah, even day to day, like even just being in some sub, like some like real real suburban nutty suburban situations, like just being like if this shit didn't happen, I would never have believed it. Like if it <laughs> happened to me, I would never have believed it. Suburbs are a scary place, man. Dog, the su- this is nothing more frightening than thinking that you will spend an eternity in the suburbs of Pretoria. <laughs> Fuck. With no friends. Yeah. Besides right. the people that you work with. Yo. I love that existential crisis and it broke me. And so it what you're saying is it if made any, a coward So of what me. you're saying is if anyone wants to get into journalism, they shouldn't. That's no. You should like look, let's be real about it, right? And I can say this because um a little bit of a background. I got into journalism, I think as I said, because it was the easiest thing ever, but also because my dad is a fantastic fucking journalist. I've never verbalized this to him and if you listen i don't think he's going to listen to this so i'm just why I'm, I'm just why i'm playing it out there but he's a changed man now um and he may listen to this now and i've never verbalized this but my dad might just be the best journalist in the country and i'm saying oh uh, you might be a little biased i I, th- I wish i was dog because there's some there's some very fucking close runners like there's Adrian Basson, who like he has his problems with like people will say he has his problems because he's Afrikaans and he works for Afrikaans and in papers. But I yeah. mean, your tri- your tribe determines your vibe. I mean, your vibe determines your tribe, yo. Um, but I saw him when he was. I saw him work with my dad. So this is also the other thing. I've seen a lot of dudes work with my dad. I've heard my dad refer work with dudes. Like I've heard my dad's opinion. I've heard other journalists who are friends with my dad's opinion. I've worked with many of the same people as well. Um, I've had disputes with some of the same people as well. Um, Were they ever like, are oh, you just like your father? Yeah, there's always that. And that, that was in the time when I was like really not into that. Yeah. Like I was out trying to not be in the shadow. Well, yeah, because your Cause, father's got a dark-ish like... Well, not, vibe to not in that. It was more like it was just me that like I didn't want... Like I'm, I'm a cocky little shit in my own way. Like if you know me, I'm kind of like... So you just wanted it for yourself? I hate being I, I compared to anyone else. Yeah, you never judge me by someone else's deeds. Like judge me by what I've done and what I've said. Like sometimes what I've said is problematic, and I'll take that. I've owned that. I've hurt a lot of people, and I've heard, I've said some things about some people that is like very true, but also like it didn't need to be said. Well, that's kind of the thing. Like when you talk about like you know some of the stuff I said when you know with DIY, D, DIY and being like super honest and stuff about stuff maybe i didn't need to be like yeah. with some things and i think i think if you've ever like known but, me but that's part of growing up is yeah. realizing that and there's some people who will not maybe say outright that they don't like me but they'll say the things about me that they don't like and forthrightness is maybe something that i've always said, i've always had about me and i think it's always been a bonding thing with us um so being front and center has never been a thing for me and i could never put myself like it's funny because like when i was a kid i did drama and i did really well and like I was an overachiever, I did really well academically, um, but I was also notorious for sneaking out and like doing some shit. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, grandparents. My parents knew, but my grandparents didn't know. My grand knows. My granddad didn't. Um, or he knew. I think I'm just living in ignorance that he didn't. Um, <laughs> my brother was a wild man as well, and yeah, we were like we were not also like we weren't destined for being the greatest kids. Like we were quite destined for being like ending up in the muck. I'm really glad that things worked out the way they did. Like, they made some sacrifices. But I could never put myself up on stage and put myself out there. Like, my forthrightness comes to honest conversations with people. Like, if you know with me is that I'm very honest with you. And, like, sometimes it's it's classified in two ways. Is that if I don't know you, like, really well. I'll say, if like, if I know you, if we're acquaintances and I know you, well, or, like, we maybe draw together. And you've done some fuck shit. I'll say, yo, you're doing some fuck shit. And I'll <laughs> say it in a way that is like pretty aggressive pretty aggressive and some also some pretty so, funny yeah hilarious and uh, I, well maybe hilarious it depends what your brand of comedy is but like but also some <laughs> like also like it's very blasé from my side i sometimes don't realize that i'm hurting feelings yeah and um 
Yeah, and yeah, because when just, someone's being fucky, like I'm you do call it out. Like people want to be <laughs> muppetry. Yeah, people want to know that they're being a muppet, you know. <laughs> oh fuck yes. So anyway, so yeah, and so it's really cool to see you like evolve in a way to that you've come to like accept criticism and you are kind of in a way you've put yourself in places where you've also like where you you put yourself in places where like you were once critical like you were critical of the radio and now you're, you're on radio yeah and i'm kind of average at it at the moment but i'm getting there but it's also it's hard to be good at radio do we were talking about this you do radio and comedy well radio is like journalism and that like if you have the basic functions of it you do it long enough you'll be good at it yeah comedy like, is like jujitsu and we were talking about this earlier which i got into jujitsu because eventually i had to leave the cca due to like pretty hectic working environments and also i was burnt out yo yeah uh, shit got shit got pretty hectic there i mean i think it's always been hectic for anyone that works at the cca i don't think anyone's ever had it easy there but, yeah and that's also the thing and that's the thing and everyone does eventually have to tap out yeah and those people are like my family i maybe have not got on with everybody that's passed through the doors there oh like, that's a family yeah um there are even some people that they are like they're like families that i wouldn't consider them part of the family but they're like some blood people that like yo like i might not be able to take a bullet for you but whatever i can do i will do for you <laughs> i'll i'll get i'll call that one one first I ain't no snitch <laughs> uh fucks with the police Sorry, i'm joking only for insurance people um but the reality is is that like so i got burnt out and i did that and i quit and that leads me to where i'm kind of at um in my career now yeah because you're kind of a journeyman now man like yeah i'm i went from being a jobber to a journeyman dude yeah. oh God, am, please don't tell me i'm which which journey which journeyman wrestler am i oh uh, dude please don't say jake the snake oh no i was gonna say or more Kevin nash no no i was just gonna say uh what's his name Can the I brooklyn brawler <laughs> fuck sakes man i was kind of hoping you were gonna say like ricochet yo like ricochet is unrespected but, but his career people. is gonna be cut short like dude i'm only 27 i know but that's like his career is going to be cut short like i don't want yours to okay cool well, thank you well then can we go with maybe maybe um maybe tyson kid um i would actually just say good old-fashioned aj styles like, he is a journeyman I'm, bl I'm blushing yeah phenomenal bro what you guys don't know is that bob's pretty much like he's pretty much like made my pa if i was wearing panties they would be wet <laughs> like I think this is going to be such a weird ass podcast for it people. Is. I mean, all our friends don't know. They don't. They they think that they know that we're friends. They don't really know. Oh okay, shit! Like that we hang out and just like watch wrestling on this couch. Yeah, because we say, often. Yeah, we're sitting on Bob's couch, and many people have ended up back at Bob's place in like in, the <laughs> in urban, some capacity. In, yeah, in like in different capacities. I think, Mostly after three a.m. Yeah, because no one else will take you. And also, <laughs> and Bob's governing body is the only governing body that would respect it amongst our, gr our group of friends. <laughs> and Scambilo was also great to us, bro. Exactly. Scambilo has been like the one like low class neighborhood that's been so good to so many suburban kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so unbelievably true. It's, it's been a, it's been a good place for like hiding out and like getting like you know into some debauchery yeah it's like it was like it was safe like they could watch the, they could watch some friends some friends of theirs brother maybe yeah, get into a fight i don't know safe-ish like ambila's also pretty hectic at times but yeah, yeah bro, but i think you know you need a strenuous life bro. <laughs> that's how it's a quote tax stone that's how you don't get hit by bullets bro. nah i'm kind of over it like so that's why i'm moving but so yeah. yeah so i'm a i'm kind of at the space where i'm, I'm yeah you're right i'm a journeyman um well I well i just mean that in that like you know like now you're you're free from your shackles and you are like on the journey now of like picking up yeah. you're freelancing like a weird thing like you're freelancing being a festival manager yeah i mean it's not always in a managerial capacity well yeah well yeah well yeah but, sometimes it is with that title well, well the thing is like management position like essentially yeah. like you're within the management staff usually yeah now people of music pe of like i didn't diff. realize this until like quite recently someone like said that i i, I, I curate programs and i do i do um i didn't realize it at the time but it's tiny Mungwe who like sat me down and was like what poet that you've been reading about on the internet do you actually like i'd be like i read that this person's kind of big and it will be cool for like a thursday night but like this person's not really that good so we don't have a big audience on this day so like let's, let's maybe move them to yeah i didn't realize that learning to schedule when films 
screen at and, night. And that's because and you that's want a, the projector to blow up because you can't afford it. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Like, so, so explain what you mean. So, um, so this is the also the interesting that working at the CCI, I never touched on this earlier. Is that like there was a combination of lowbrow art um, and high end entertainment, but I was interested interest used to the mechanics of of the art scene, how a fest, how events run, and like the the day to day. So everything from your functionals to timelines to report to like to like timelines to meetings to minutes to structures and all yeah. that shit. Right. Then I learned the other side, which is the technical. Technical, which is, is projection, KDMs, DCPs, um, DCP, digital cinema projection. KDM is a is a code that you use to unlock it. It's how it's the it's the it's the world's weapon and, against pi piracy. And this was kind of the fuck up, like when, when I first started. When on twenty thirteen, that There's was no, the biggest issue. Because this is this is when they had introduced across the world um all this everyone had decided that they were going to use a thing called dcp to protect um almost we're, we're, um to protect themselves from being pirated and they would have these things called kdms and you have a specific service certificate to that matches um to the to the to your to the to the projector and to the venue so the people and because you can't really buy those projectors you lease them for a good couple of years you rent to buy them for like six months for like six years or some shit and then you can kind of trade it in or you can kind of like hand it back okay but you don't really hold on to them forever so you that's why like movies are so expensive because they're trying to make back their shit um but at the same time it's also it doesn't make sense because the people who can't afford it like the movies are being made yeah anyway so but i was also introduced to like the funding and the administrative side in terms of the how you get a f how you get something off the ground if you can't get private capital so i was introduced to that um and because of that experience running probably one of the biggest film festivals was sitting on the right hand of multiple people who have run big the biggest events whether it be poetry or film or um literature or even contemporary dance um what little i know about contemporary dance being around leanne lutz like i could i could program it if i wanted to not to say that I am. You're ever going to, but <laughs> it's definitely not for me. But like, yeah. So like, it's nice to have that in your back pocket. I could never do that without the people I worked with, you know. Because like, it was also one thing. Like, I had also been there were moments in my managerial phase because like I got thrown into management. I like literally got dropped in. Like how I got dropped in to management is, and it's kind of like it's kind of like it's kind of been like the thing for me is that like if you if you've known me is that like if shit's going kind of awry, you kind of call Mitchell. <laughs> to come in to come in and like help like set up a system or some shit so like yeah def you you're definitely like there's certain problems that you can definitely help fix yeah and uh, in terms of especially like with films and events and that's yeah. kind of been it like you know the right people now like over the years you've you've also know the right systems you've handled a lot of the issues before so yeah and i've worked with i've worked with different people in different capacities who've also assisted for like those great events because also those great events so you aren't just happen aren't don't just happen in-house there's also role players outside yeah so you've and got I've lots of people to like dude, call on and who you've helped who helped you back like. yeah and I've, I've made some people within durban and without i've made some people internationally that is incredible um but i also didn't think that my like getting into art through like being a punk and like my fervent attack for art would then come in so handy much later on in life like uh, like it was basic with the sm like with the sm it was like we would like need to fill some pages like i don't know if you remember like i had you like, yeah some shit yeah no something. i do i've got still got that like you i've still, still got yeah dude <laughs> i've got like all the like yeah, newspaper stuff still like i'm actually yeah. going to be going through all of that as i like clear out my house yeah i gotta i, I gotta make one complaint about the independent newspapers is not only do they not pay very well and if bell survey might be a bit of a fucking nightmare um, your archiving in the years of 2010, and I said this when I was there, 2010 to 2014, what in the fuck were you doing digitally? Like, it was a nightmare. Like, I can't find hardly any of my shit online anymore. Like, I have to go to the digital archiving. Like, Dude, digital I struggle to find stuff for even, like, big websites whenever, like, they re, like, do this, like, their stuff, and then, like, my stuff, like, just disappears. And my, my name's yeah. no longer on them, and it, it now becomes staff writer or something. Yeah, that's true. That's also, but that one you can always go back and claim, because, unless it's, it's kind of contractually, because you and I come from the world, because there's something else that I've been doing, is that I got back into writing when I got out, because there's only so many festivals that you can work in a year. Yeah. And I've worked most of the, f at some point, at some capacity in my life i've worked for pretty much every film festival bar i think if i remember correctly it's two 
there's one i think it's technically two and a half because i almost worked for one and then it didn't happen at the at the last hour um oh it's actually yeah it's two and a half festivals that i haven't i haven't really worked for um that i haven't like curate i've sat in a curation or sat in like a high-end position and it's it's kind of weird because also i definitely often when i walk into those doors i'm always like fuck am i being i'm getting a, i'm getting fucking imposter complex right now like do i really deserve to be even here? though you've done this before yeah dude and it's it's, it's totally hilarious because tiny mungwe who's like kind of my mentor and kind of like helped me like get my shit together in terms of like really showing me the ropes of like how to be a hustler like she took she helped me take all the knowledge i learned from hustling in my earlier life and through journalism and like into all my craftiness into like actual like productive she was like she really made me go from eddie guerrero as that as intercontinental <laughs> champion with china to being a, a main uh, to a headliner oh uh, well yeah he did that on his ace and then but the, she, then it was the but she then... like she like taught me how to do it you know what i mean she like kind of whispered in my ear and like so but she also talked we talk about this often because we're young dude and like and it's a trip for me i uh, it's like being young it must be even being worse being young and being like it's being young and being of color is hectic but being young and of color and female must be fucking hectic to do what we do yeah because a lot of our shit is the old boys club it's yeah. older white dudes uh if not it's younger so you're white not dudes. respected yeah um i mean 2017 to 2018 was a radical change for the politics of the film industry i think women have like made this space i gotta give it up to the last project that i work on it was probably the most inclusive program i've ever been on and in terms of like which project was that i'm going to shout it out it was the cape town international film marketing festival cool yeah you were down there, yeah, I was there like a, about a two month. months ago yeah about, a month ago yeah i was there for a, about a month and a half in the trenches big up to rebecca beaumont and to all the good people of cape town who looked after me while i was there um but yeah i was in there and i was like working with a guy who actually i met at a film festival it was kind of hilarious because he was an unhappy custom he was a actually a difficult customer he's a at if you know him he gets what he wants and he'll admit it he like he works to what he wants and he doesn't <sighs> make people unhappy and it's a respectable quality especially and he and i i think he actually respected me because i once stood up to him i was like no that's not how you talk to you to people and yeah like who is this kid talking to me like this um yeah i hate people like that though yeah but also i understand it because it's <sighs> like you I understand it but there's better ways to motivate when you're hustling often i feel I've, like i've just seen the management styles and i've seen which one works better yeah and motivation like through like motivation well he wasn't actually 90 percent of the he time is actually better. a great motivator actually he's okay. more like he is more like one of those to quote gucci main it gets lost in, he got lost in the source every yeah oh yeah. Uh, yeah and it was like because he often often comes back and it's like yo i'm sorry for like the way i spoke uh, speak okay that's uh, cool so like but i was surrounded by an incredible team um who were all fresh to doing film festivals you know which was pretty pretty incredible and i mean the exhibition program went pretty it was a huge festival for for that it's probably one of the biggest numbers i've ever seen so that was always going to be a juggle on its own but in terms of a market program yo man i worked with some kids who restored my faith in like young people because me being a journalist me being like jaded and shit like that i I, I grew up quite disenfranchised and like it's kind of funny because like my thesis paper for my retech was like complaining about citizen journalism and like how i thought it was going to lead to like the bastardization of news aka <laughs> fake news yeah and um and i, I always preached it was a worry because I, I understood where like traditional media came from like not wanting to like hop on the bad wagon but like the problem is they they because they hopped on it so late they they lo got lost in like their ability to remain credible and then they started getting in fucking fist fights because that's where we are as, as a human race yeah um but i was surrounded by like these kids dude that like who were previously i'd been like i'd often dealt with kids like a when i was at varsity like when i got to varsity i was very scared about how, like how hard kids found it to work hard and then how hard um I found took that into journalism as well with the interns other interns that worked with us that how hard they found it to be like good at their job to just do their job properly yeah i mean what's what's your thinking with that um i definitely think it's being it's the it's like we we're soft as a people dog i mean it's 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 it sounds really weird but like we're protected by a veil of like i sound like a 50 year old white dude yeah like, we keep trying to give ourselves more protections we do dog and i think that's being confronted with criticism is character building bro 
and being able to talk to people is cool but calling out from a point of high hoarseness when you yourself have uh transgressed in the exact same forms or even like um i mean i've done that but yeah, yeah we all have but like i mean that's it's not healthy dude it's not like it doesn't progress anything no it's but that's like that's the thing like you do that because you are, you're kind of ashamed that you did it and like mm. you don't want to still be relatable to that person so you, you shit on them don't you think it's more respectable to say yo i was a fucker yeah that's kind of what i do <laughs> like yeah that, that's very much the whole but you were always like yo i'm a fuck up so what yeah now but you're the... more like yeah i was a fuck up and i'd prefer not to be yeah Fuck you, saw the words from my mouth. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I always thought you were interesting like that. But yeah, there was definitely. I mean, but that's the thing. When I was younger, I was nihilistic as fuck, and I wanted to die. And like, I just yeah, like yeah. I didn't really care much. You about also come from I didn't point. care about like what people thought about me. And also, like, when you come from a, like not having everything like easily given to you, like when you have to hustle, you have to work, you sometimes have to steal. And I'm not gonna say I've always stole, but I've maybe <laughs> I've definitely fucking done some done some shit. I've like I've hustled like i mean i was like i was like selling nougat at, at glenwood oh uh, i've yeah I've, I've had my enterprises you know i yeah i've had like, my enterprises like everyone's done their shits and um you you grow up like a little like vengeful and angry and you know you're not willing sometimes to always like you're like it's harder for you to like accept the fact that's because you come with a chip on your shoulder because having because like not understanding well you have a chip on your shoulder because you don't have all the things that everyone else has and the big chip on your shoulder is not understanding that and not understanding that was like the big crucial moment of getting older when you realize that yo you're just that life is really a roll of the dice you're but a sperm shot from someone's suck yeah and like that person could be a shit person that person could be a great person you but you you get to choose how you be you could land up in a really you could land up with great people in a terrible situation you could land up with, with great people in a great situation you could land up with fucking it's kind of like the anti-joker thing yeah. like you know because the joke is always like you like you know you're just one bad day away and like you know and the thing is that depends on which time of your life that comes i guess because like you know as i've gotten older like i've definitely gone more towards like no like you should always try to be good like even like in the most darkest and dire of situations yeah well it's like for me i went from that point of like not giving a fuck to more being like i'm already surrounded by muppets and cunts do i want to be one of those already i'm already a cunt as it is yeah that's yeah. that's kind of also it. like when you see your old behavior like mirrored to you like online and you're just like oh yeah fuck yeah. i was i was that guy too like yeah like that's horrible like i never want to be that guy yeah. again and i think i think there's not enough character building that happens when you're young um i think like parents being asked to work too much uh is a big thing yeah i think the school system i'm a big uh, yo dude i am, school's fucking whack it's fucking whack yo but I, I would also be petrified to have a child to like because like how the fuck am i gonna like teach my child I don't yeah have time to, i don't have time to be yeah and how am i gonna feed him from my from at home i can't afford to get a tutor like, yeah like that's just hard enough as it is but i'm gonna find some disenfranchised teacher who wants to teach it one child only like you're hoping that's gonna work out yeah and you're gonna have enough money to be able to pay for that exact amount yeah no okay so are we go are we ending there on just like everything's fucked where, where are we going with this so i'm just gonna say that like I'm almost famous by like no choice in terms of well by no way of my own volition by like except um, you know it's the almost perfect podcast it's, right? it's almost been perfect because I can never see it through I guess right I'm kind of like I'm kind of now like freelancing and like living my life but I'm also I'm at the happiest and like I'm I found jujitsu I found like you know I like yeah, you seem I've, to I've be been, I've, been, I've spent the last year like a lot more these days yeah I, I definitely am I spent the last year surrounding myself with great people um, one particular person in particular was really good for me. Um, you know, I, I know how that can help. Yeah, and that's dog. Although, that's like, pay. yeah, although, like, men, you know, women aren't, like, what's it, the therapist for broken? Yeah, we're definitely, they're like not there to fix us, yo. They're yeah, yeah. Definitely not there. And I've always wondered because, like, the most amazing women in my life that I've known who are my friends always have the most, some of the most appalling taste in men. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at them, I'm Fuck like, you. I'm like, of all the conscious decisions that you can take, how the fuck are you ending up with that dick? Yeah, but the thing is, you know me, and, like, people who really know me, like, who don't just, like, buy into yeah, the persona. Yeah, but you're a fucking sweetheart, dog. Exactly, that's the thing. Like, if you don't just buy into the persona, like, then you yeah. get why, like, someone like Paige will be with someone like me. Yeah, for sure, dog. You're very much, like, you, you run that gimmick of, like, of, like, um, CM Punk, but you kind of are. 
It's like I'm trying not to be loved, but I need the love. But also, <laughs> but also, uh, why, I, but I really like, fucking do though. But also, like, if if you show me love, I will I, I will show you love. Yeah, like, and that's always been like the one thing I've always said about you, dog. Like, I've cried on your couch, dog. Like <laughs> we were just talking about here, like, like we have spent like there's probably been more people who spent more time at your place but like we've I've, spent some deep moments here shit and like i've had some meaningful times of all hours of the of the day here yeah even in the daylight daylight yeah dude many times in the daylight dude, we just, we've hung out dog. we've just hung out yeah um it's really dope to see you where you're at i want to talk about almost perfect because this is almost perfect it's almost <laughs> perfect that you, it's what's perfect is that you have a podcast finally finally i've been talking about it for years yeah we talked about this for years um what's almost perfect is that you just can't get the caliber of guests that you really deserve <laughs> to have at the end yet but like no disrespect to any of the people who've been on first but like you've got me it's yeah like, no but like you've you've been on the list for a while and like this week just kind of made it work out that it was going to be you now yeah like i don't think like it's weird like this conversation's actually gone a little bit strange because we're like we've more documented your life than got your opinions 100%, but actually, yeah. this, and like maybe sorry well yeah we, i think we'll do this again sometime also this is super long i don't think people are going to listen to the whole thing so we got all the good stuff at the end there that no one's going to hear so yeah. two-parted we, yeah we're definitely going to have to do this again yeah. again and then we'll be more structured about it i'll bring Al notes although we should probably just start our own podcast like yeah dude i think that's going to be a thing at some point i think at some point like the mediums oh so yeah it's progressed through technology as well as being the reason why like kids uh, are soft it's but like i mean i thing. also think like technology helped me so much to get to where i am it helped me like outwit outplay outlast like a hundred percent gave me dog. a leg up like in a, a Dude, world that like i like without technology i fucking don't know what i'd be doing so i i disagree with that because i think like there were always those kids like you know those kids who like found who found like punk through like the, the mailing list or some shit like that because that's <laughs> the medium they would have gone through it right i think kids are softer now because like the medium is there for you to do legitimately whatever dog you used to be have to do a trade to be a knife maker i'm probably in the next year going to attempt to make a knife fair enough you know what i mean like i've already like i've already made like so whilst you're like shit. so you're whilst you're working liberal you're also like just manly man i'm a fucking savage at heart dog i hate it like if anybody knows me they like they kind of know that i do kind of like to see people get the shit beat out of them yeah no that's why we go watch mfc together thank you Jono. i just want to say thanks to all the people who put that on because that's actually really dope because that's actually been a big thing that was like so i actually got into jujitsu years ago didn't do it kind of like got into like fiddled around with muay thai very briefly but was always interested and found it last year after kind of like needing a mental health break and i think like how you we talked about this often how you like found the thing you loved with comedy after like taking a step back yeah and i think taking a step back and really looking at yourself i want to end on this it doesn't hurt to take some take a look in to yourself and how you do that is it definitely extreme. hurts well it hurts but i mean in the long run you probably hurt a lot less people or like the hurt would be a lot less spread um if you just really take a look at yourself and be less of a i want to say be less of a cunt because sometimes being a cunt can be cool yeah it's sometimes being a cunt is useful it's very useful trust me as someone who's been a cunt for a good time but like a good cunt um like just trying to do right and like it's like not it's not the it's not the hardest thing on the planet yo it really fucking isn't do the right thing yo like spark fucking lee dude exactly or aubrey do right and kill everything <laughs> <laughs> uh shut bro thanks people thanks for listening and sorry yeah i, th I think we're good there <laughs>